30, those kind of, those kind of things. Now, I'm going to refer your attention to a particular date, January 7th of 2022. Uh, did you receive a call for service? Yes, sir. Actually, I wasn't uh, assigned the call that particular day. I saw a call for service, came across the radio. Um, uh, dispatch advised us that, that a caller stated they, there was a baby found in a dumpster. What did you do in response to that call? So I was just a few blocks away at the time the call came in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I decided to go ahead and respond to the, uh, to the area. And taking this just one, one step at a time, where was this uh, dumpster located? Did you point? It's located behind uh, Rig Outfitters, um, just directly behind the business. Uh, could you describe for the jury with a little bit more particularity, uh, you know, what city and general location this uh, Rig sure. Outfitters is located? Sure, Rig, Rig Outfitters uh, is obviously located in, in Hobbs, New Mexico. Um, it's the location that I actually went to behind, uh, uh, sorry, behind Rig Outfitters is, I believe, the uh, intersection of U and Four, I believe. Is Rig Outfitters a freestanding structure, or is it part of a, 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 a strip mall or a general it's, mall? It's part of a strip mall. Okay. <coughs> and with regards to the dumpster that you were going to, did you know whether it would be at the front of the store or at the back of the store? Uh, just special advice us, it was at the back of the store, primarily. So is that where you went? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the conditions uh, that, uh, that evening. Uh, first, in terms of, of like January 7th, uh, approximately what time uh, were you heading uh, About 7.44, uh, um, about 15 till 8, something like that, in the evening. What were the light conditions at that time? It was dark. What about temperature that night? Um, it was somewhere 36 to 40 degrees, somewhere in that, that, that temperature range. In terms of the clothing that you were wearing that night, were you anticipating the weather in any way in terms of your choice of clothing? So yes, what I normally do, especially when it's cold, is try to wear uh, a t-shirt and then of course my body armor, then my outside, <clears throat> excuse my uniform. Uh, that usually keeps me fairly warm, but on this particular night, it, it wasn't enough. So, And at this point, Your Honor, uh, permission to approach the witness with what's been pre-marked at States 34. You may. Uh, do you recognize who I'm uh, handing to you, sir? Yes. Uh, just in terms of, of some foundational questions, uh, in, in your department, do you wear body worn cameras? Yes, correct. Uh, did you record uh, your uh, uh, interactions that night with your body worn camera? Yes, sir. I kept my body camera once I got out of my, out of my unit. Uh, about how much body worn camera uh, did you generate that night? I honestly don't remember how much I, I, I generated that night. It was altogether probably several hours at least, I would imagine, something like that. And in terms of uh, the contents of that disc, have you reviewed the contents of that disc prior to your testimony today? Yes, sir. Uh, does that disc contain about a minute and 17 seconds of your body on camera? Yes, sir, yes. Uh, what, if anything, does it show that you can describe for the jury, just very generally? Uh, it shows my interaction, responding to the scene, uh, responding to the call, being the first unit uh, on scene. And for the portion of your body worn camera, are the contents of that disc a fair and accurate representation of that minute and 17 seconds of your uh, first encounter? Yes, sir. Yes. Your Honor, at this time the state moves for the admission of 34. No yeah. objection. Exhibit 34 is received and may be published. Thank you, Your Honor.
Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep them, keep them warm, keep them covered up, keep them warm. Just keep them warm. Keep them wrapped up, keep them warm. Who found them? Okay. Hey, you guys have a crack in my foot? They heard him crying and I was like, I the bag and I was like, oh my god. Which dumpster? Yeah, keep him wrapped up. He's right here. You know whose baby it is? Is it your baby? No. No, it's not. We're dumpster guys. We're just getting the guy from the blood. Okay. Poor baby. Oh. You want to put him in the in the unit where he can get warm? So, officer, some follow-up questions for you. Uh, did you recognize the officer that was holding uh, the baby at the end of that video? Yes, that's Officer Maxwell. Uh, and with reference to the vehicle that the baby was located in, uh, could you describe to the jury uh, what vehicle you saw? The baby? Um, I believe this was an older model uh, Chevy pickup truck. Uh, while you were at the scene, what was your number one concern? Uh, my number one concern is to make sure that we didn't expose the baby more than uh, he had already been exposed and keep him covered up and keep him as, <clears throat> excuse me, as warm as possible. Why were you concerned about exposure? Well, when I walked up to the, to the truck, um, obviously April opened um, the towel to let me see him, so as cold as it was, and again, I was, I was already cold being out there, uh, the baby didn't have any, any kind of covering whatsoever, so my, my immediate concern was to get make sure that he stayed covered up and not exposed to you know any more colder weather than he already had been. Uh, were you able to tell uh, by viewing the baby uh, what the baby's condition was, back to the extent that we could? Yeah, so my, my impression when I looked at the child, the child, you know, I had uh, dried blood on blood, uh, dried blood on the uh, on the towel. The the towel appeared to be damp. Um, so just my initial immediate reaction was the baby's probably very, very cold. Um, so when she opened up the, the towel, I told her, let's, you know, obviously just cover him up and let's keep him covered up uh, until paramedics get here, which they were only like, I think, a minute or, minute, minute or two behind us. Uh, with regards to uh, the, the work that you did at the scene after uh, the baby was handed off to Officer Maxwell, uh, what, if anything, did you do next? So after uh, Officer Maxwell took the child to um, um, the ambulance and attended to the hospital, I then turned my attention to, to the three individuals that I had made contact with, which was April Nuttall, uh, Hector Jaso, uh, and uh, Michael Green. And I asked them uh, what, was, what occurred that night. And each of them basically gave me the same story. <clears throat> Forgive my, my voice. They also they each told me that they were there dumpster diving behind uh, rig outfitters because they were looking for any, any. And I'll just stop you there uh, because we're just going to be focusing on your observations and the investigation you took. Uh, would it be fair to say that you uh, interviewed Hector, April, yes. and Michael? Yes, sir. That's right. uh, And based off that information, what, if anything, did you do next? Uh, after I uh, took their information down and got their statements and what they told me, I then began um, to try to write the, the report. We had enough officers on the scene that we. We secured the scene, I repositioned my patrol unit uh, to the alley, and then began writing the, the base uh, report. With regards to the scene, uh, did you perform any steps to you know, collect forensic evidence or collect video or take pictures or anything of that nature? No, sir, I did not. The other officers and detective Chris did not. We contacted CID as soon as uh, we arrived on scene, or shortly after we arrived on scene, CID was contacted. And they began that that that. Are we waiting for them to arrive to do that process? The rest of the officers were on scene, basically securing it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about with regards to video of the scene? Did you ever come to uh, acquire knowledge that there was a video uh, in that outlet? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure which officer um, contacted the, the owner of Rig Outfitters, uh, but while I worked on my report, at some point in time, the officers went into Rig Outfitters and made contact with the owner of it, and, and that's when I found out there was video. Okay, and when you found out there was video, what did you do next? So I went inside, uh, made contact with uh, 
uh, Joseph, who is the owner of Rig Outfitters, and he showed me uh, a video of what he what he had found. And were you able to view the video that he found? Yes, he, he played the video for me, um, which, if I remember correctly, was started at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, where the video showed a white vehicle pulling up next to the dumpster, uh, and then a female getting out of the vehicle and extracting a, what appears to be a trash bag out of the back seat and tossing it into the dumpster. Uh, did you know at the time that you viewed the video who the suspect was that was responsible for throwing the baby into the dumpster? Uh, what steps, if any, did you take to uncover who the suspect was? So, um, I'm not sure which officer had been in contact with dispatch, but we only had a partial tag on the vehicle. Uh, the first part of the plate is all we were able to, to see in the video. Um, I did notice also in the video that there was a, a some type of a white sticker in the back windshield of, of, of the vehicle, and that the hubcap on the uh, driver's side rear uh, tire was missing. <clears throat> so. Uh, so, with that information of the description of the Jetta, uh, some unique characteristics of the sticker, the hubcap, and the partial for the plate, uh, did you end up following up and identifying the, the vehicle from the video? Yes, sir. Eventually did. Yes, we were given a full plate, uh, by, I believe, by dispatch, and so and we later on went up to the address where the registered owner was for the vehicle. What address was it that you went to? Uh, I believe it was on McKenzie Street. Don't forgive me, I'm, my, that may not, may not be correct. I believe on McKenzie Street, 809 McKenzie, I think. Okay, and, and you're saying, um, I, I think, would it be fair to say that uh, you're, uh, uh, that you would put that information in, in your report before you describe it? Uh, and would your report have that uh, address indicated yes, on it? Yes, sir. Uh, would a review of your report refresh your recollection as to exactly what address you went to? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, permission to uh, approach the witness with this report? Uh, and don't don't testify from it. Just review your report. And I'm directing your attention to the bottom of the report. Uh, is your recollection refreshed, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, and what was the address that you went to? 809 West McKinsey. In terms of the distance between Rig Outfitters and McKenzie Street, uh, are you able to provide just sort of a ballpark of the distance between the two? Uh, it's at least several blocks away. Okay. <clears throat> When you went to the McKenzie uh, address, were you able to uh, see the vehicle that you believe was uh, on the video? Yes, sir, that's correct. So when I arrived with uh, Detective Perez, uh, we both drove over there at the same time, and I saw a vehicle that appeared to match the, the video from uh, the car from the video. So when you see that the vehicle matches the vehicle that's depicted on the video, uh, what steps, if any, did you take to make sure that that is, is taken, collected? Um, it, pictures were, I believe, taken of the vehicle. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we um, eventually just, I don't remember the steps after that. I think we ended up seizing the vehicle and, and processed it uh, at the PD. I wasn't a part of it. And just to make sure that we're clear on what vehicle you observed at the same, just for purposes of our reference. Uh, Your Honor, permission to approach the witness with what's been pre-marked as 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, for purposes of identification. You may approach. Yes, yeah, so this is the vehicle that we make contact with at that residence. Uh, are these pictures a fair and accurate representation of the vehicle uh, that you observed at the McKenzie uh, address? Yes, sir, it is. Your Honor, at this time the state moves for the admission of 9 through 14. Any objection? No objection. Uh, state's exhibits 9 through 14 are received and may be published.
All right, so I have uh, exhibit nine uh, on the Elmo string. Sir, what part of the vehicle is uh, observed here in the front of the vehicle? Publishing exhibit 10. Is this a different perspective? You left quarter panel? You are sent. Exhibit 11. You left quarter panel with rear of the vehicle. Uh, are you able to see the uh, that, that plate? Yes, partial plate, yes, sir. And you made reference earlier in your direct examination to a sticker. Is that the sticker that you observed? Yes, sir. It appears to be the same sticker. Is it a 12? The bin from the vehicle. Is it a 13? Uh, insurance company from the vehicle. And is it a 14? And the license plate. What was the significance, if any, uh, of identifying the vehicle that you saw on the screen of the video? It's, it, I mean, it appears to be the exact same vehicle that we saw in the video. Um, even the and I saw here on the uh, registration uh, names of uh, uh, Martha and Domingo uh, Avila. Uh, did you uh, ever come to see them when you were at the house? Yes, Detective Perez and I did uh, make contact with them at the house. Uh, did you ever make contact with them? Um, well, once we once we arrived at the residence, I basically at that point began a uh, like a subordinate role. I let Detective Perez take the lead on this investigation because he's there with me. So uh, he made contact with them and he did uh, talk with them. I didn't really speak with them very much at all. Okay. Would it be fair to say that after the vehicle was identified, that uh, that concluded the substantive steps that you took in this investigation? Yes, sir, that is correct. All right. uh, one moment to confer with counsel. Uh, Your Honor, the pass as the witness. Cross exam. If I have just a moment. You may. I didn't, uh, I didn't observe it up close. I just observed it just based on when I was talking to them. I was able to turn and see, see the bag sitting out in front of the dumpster. Okay. So was there another officer, maybe other officers to search the bag, look further into it? There, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure which other officer was out there uh, to make contact with the bag. I know that I didn't go over there to do anything with it. Um, so again, I left that to Detective Perez. Okay, and so the next thing you did was go to, well, you did eventually find the car, correct? The location where the car was. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, no, Your Honor. Any questions from the jury? Any objection to excusing Officer Burke? Not from the city. Not from the city. You're excused, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, your next witness. They will call Officer Jennifer Maxwell. And once again, uh, jury, if you want to stretch your legs while we wait, please feel free to stand.
please swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of law. You may be seated. Good morning. Please state your name for the jury. Officer Jennifer Maxwell. Where are you employed? Hobbs Police Department. And how long have you been employed with the Hobbs Police Department? Since 2016. And what is your current position with the Hobbs Police Department? I'm a patrol officer. And are you a certified and commissioned law enforcement officer in the state of New Mexico? Yes, ma'am. And how long have you been a commissioned officer? Since 2019. Now, um, tell the, the jury, um, were you uh, on duty or working on January 7th of 2022? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what time of day shift were you working on that day? It was night shift. It was after 7. And uh, did you have an area or an assignment for that evening? I didn't. I was filling in that night, so I was just roving, so I was assigned to everywhere. And uh, did, you, did it come about that you went to the area of the Broadmoor Mall, mall due to some type of call? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how did that come about? It was a medical call that dispatch gave out over the radio. Now, do you recall what time of evening it was that you went out on that call? It was after 7, but before 8 o'clock. I don't know the exact time. Now, uh, when you uh, responded, uh, was this a respond with like lights and sirens, or how did you respond? Yes, um, we were told it was a life-threatening matter, matter, so anytime there's life at risk, we run with our lights and sirens. How far away, uh, if you recall, were you when you were notified to go to the Broadmoor Mall? I was several blocks away. I would probably say probably three or four miles away, and I made it there pretty quick. Uh, was any other officer already there when you got there? Yes. Uh, what was occurring? What were you seeing as you arrived? Um, when I got there, the officers were standing by a truck, and so I ran over to where they were, and then that's when I made contact with April. And um, who was April that you're referring to? Uh, she was the female that was sitting in the truck and holding the baby. Describe what you were seeing as you saw this female inside of the truck. So she had on like a hoodie or something, like a jacket, and she, there was, it was like a wet towel, and the baby was inside her jacket, wrapped in a wet towel sitting on her chest. I asked her if it was her baby, and she said no, and then I took the baby from her. Now, as you took the baby from her, describe uh, how did that towel feel? Um, so that night it was probably about 40 degrees or lower, and that towel was wet, like, and the towel even felt, you know, if you put like a wet towel in the freezer, that's what it felt like. It was super cold. As you took the baby, tell us what you could observe about the baby. Um, I could tell he was breathing. I could tell it was a boy. He had dried blood on him, and you could see that his umbilical cord had been cut. Um, he wasn't moving, he didn't open his eyes, um, he was, like even when you rub a baby's hand in, or their palm and they grasp your, he didn't do any of that. He wasn't hardly breathing at all, he wouldn't move at all. What did you do as you, you take this baby, you got him, where are you going, what are you doing? So the ambulance hadn't got there yet, so I took him to my unit, and I didn't have a jacket or blanket or anything. All I had was one of those neck gator things that keeps your neck warm. So I took the wet towel off of the, off of him and I, I put his little body in that little neck gator thing and then I just held him in my unit because I had already had the heater going because it was freezing. So I just kind of held him in there and just kind of rubbed him a little to maybe get some circulation going until the ambulance got there. Now what if anything happened with that towel that had been on the baby? Uh, I'm pretty sure it got logged into evidence. But I mean, but like when you took it off, did you, was it like laying in your unit? Oh, oh yeah. It's a bad question on my part. Yeah, just thrown to the... And um, as you remove that towel, were you able to see the baby 
uh, a little clearer, more fully? Yes, I could tell that he was a boy. Um, he had a little bruise or a cut on his forehead. And again, I mean, he was, he was very cold and like his, I mean, he was still covered in blood, like dried blood, so you could tell he was kind of blue and kind of red from the blood, and he just had, like his skin didn't look right at all. Like his skin was, I guess it was not freezer, not what is it, frostbite, maybe. It looked like he was, just, he needed some medical help. Now, how long, if you know, were you uh, with the baby now in the, that net gator inside your unit before any EMS arrived to further assist? I would say it had to have been maybe two, three minutes tops. And as soon as they pulled up, I took the baby and I went straight to the ambulance. They opened the door and I just handed them off. And so it's not like the ambulance staff came to your door or to you or anything like that? No, I took him over there to them. Now, once you handed uh, the baby to the ambulance staff, did you like have, you know, was this like a conversation about what you saw or anything? No, but we put him in and I shut the door and I told them that I would escort them to the hospital with lights and sirens, which is, we call it code three. Um, they ran with lights and sirens and I cleared all the intersections. That way they didn't have to stop at all to get into the hospital. Now, once the ambulance was at the hospital, what did you do? Um, I stayed there with the baby because he, we didn't have anybody else there with him. And so until CYFD showed up, which I called on the way to the hospital, I called for a CYFD worker to meet me at the hospital. And so I stayed there with the baby because he's basically in my custody until we find placement for him. And when you got uh, to the hospital, where did you go? I mean, physically, like, where are you at? And we went to Lee Regional Hospital into the emergency room on the ambulance entrance. And when we pulled up, there was a whole medical crew standing there. I don't remember if they, I'm pretty sure they just carried him out. I don't think they had him on a gurney. I don't know. I don't, I don't recall any of that. But as soon as they got him into the hospital, they put him straight to a trauma room. Now, did you follow to the trauma room? Yes. Uh, and I, what did you observe occurring uh, inside that trauma room? So they, they took him, because they, the medics I think had wrapped him in a blanket, so they took him out and they started assessing him. They started trying to get like vital signs. They tried to start an IV. And at one point they did start an IV. And even when they were poking his little skin, he didn't even budge, he moved nothing. I'm sorry. Um, they were telling, I was, I was so, right there in the way that a couple times they had to tell me to get out of the way. What about telling her to get out of the way? I wasn't sure where she was going with that. Overruled. So as they were assessing the baby, I was just paying attention. Um, I did ask the doctor how, like if, how old the baby was or whatever, and then he told me all that. Yeah. Okay. Sustained. And, and, and I just need you to tell us what you observe, not what someone else does. Right. Um, so uh, as you're uh, observing uh, the baby uh, there while they're treating him, uh, you said there's nurses, doctors, they're starting to be. Uh, what else do you see uh, going on uh, with the baby at that time? They were trying to get a body temperature of him with a um, digital thermometer. And they weren't, it, his temperature was so low it wouldn't even register on the thermometer. Um, you know, they tried under his arm and even getting a rectal um, temperature and they couldn't, it wouldn't even register. Now, um, you uh, were in the trauma room. How long do you think you were in the, the trauma room at uh, Lee Regional Hospital with uh, this baby? I was there for probably 45 minutes to an hour until CYFD got there. When CYFD got there, I had to leave to go respond to other calls, and then I got called back to the hospital. And then I stayed there probably another hour until the um, flight crew got there. Now you said you were called back to the hospital. Were you called back 
related to this baby, or you call back for some other matter you were working Related to the baby. I, so why were you called back related to the baby? I mean, you had left, CYD's there. One of the nurses that worked there wanted to tell me something, and she didn't want me to tell me over the phone. So you came back to maybe get some information, and yes. I don't want you to say what somebody right. said, but it was part of the investigation. Yes. Okay. So uh, after you talked to that person, you said that you stayed. Yes. Uh, and what was going to occur with the baby next that made you stay at the hospital? Um, they were going to fly him to Lubbock for a more advanced care. And did you assist in any way with the baby getting moved from uh, the Lee Ridgeville Hospital on with that flight crew? Yeah, so when the flight crew got there, they needed to rewrap him and secure him into their little incubator thing that they secure them into the fly him out. And so they asked me to pick him up so they could get the blankets under him. And so you did that? Yes. And then once the flight crew had the baby secured and they left, uh, did that end your involvement that evening? Yes, it did. Um, now, um, while you were um, in the um, trauma room uh, initially, let's go back. So while you were in the trauma room initially with uh, this baby boy, uh, did uh, you observe them uh, trying to ever like kind of remove some of that dry blood, uh, clean the baby to better be able to see the baby? Yes, I even tried to help. Like we had baby wipes that we were trying to wipe his, you know, at least get his hands clean. But every time we would like wipe him with the wipe, and they weren't freezing cold, but they weren't like probably room temperature. But every time that we would try to do that, it would bring his body temperature down. So, so they to stop trying to clean him up until his body temperature could stay up. Now, uh, you mentioned that they started uh, an IV. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see them start um, any anything else related to his care? Not that I recall. Um, now, you talked about the uh, seeing the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have you, had you had any training or experience prior to the night of January 7th of 2022 with uh, like someone giving childbirth, having to aid with that, aiding with, you know, taking the baby, maybe cutting the umbilical cord. Had you had any of that kind of experience? Well, I, I've had three kids and I've been present during the birth of some other children, but um, not professionally training, no professional training or anything like that. Uh, did you observe anything about that umbilical cord uh, that concerns you with how it was at the time you had the baby. Yes, because you, I mean, it wasn't like a clean cut, and n normally when you have a baby, they cut the umbilical cord and put that little plastic thing around it to secure it, and, and it's really short, and his was still pretty long. And so there was nothing securing the end, mm -hmm. uh, and it was longer than normal. Yeah, and it didn't look like a straight cross. It was kind of... Okay. Like torn almost. Uh, did you see them? Uh, other than you said they started an IV. Was this for a clear liquid? Did the baby, you know, maybe need blood, anything like that uh, while you were there? I this I believe was just to get maybe Objection. get. Objection. This question calls for speculation. Sustained. Did you observe any uh, thing being administered to the baby that you could identify what it was? This is a clear liquid. Um, was the baby uh, ever, you know, like weighed, measured, the things they do with a newborn while you were present to observe that? Yes, yeah, so they had put him on the scale and he weighed six pounds, seven ounces, and I saw that on the little scale. Now, um, your Honor, I have what are marks for identification, uh, States Exhibits 5, 6, 7, and 8. They are photographs. I sent them to Defense Counsel, Your Honor. Uh, there's no objection to their admission. All right. Uh, States Exhibits 5, 6, 7, and 8 are received and may be published. Thank you. Uh, I'm placing uh, on the uh, 
the viewer was marked for notification states exhibit five, now admitted. Officer Maxwell, uh, what are we seeing uh, in states exhibit five? This is the baby that we took to the hospital. Now, we can see um, that he, he seems to have um, like some, some things on him, stuck on his, kind of on his chest, something maybe going uh, into uh, his mouth. Yes, the pacifier. And um, uh, you were there during the time that they were trying to begin all of these things uh, to take care of the baby. Yes, and while they were doing the IV, I was even trying to see if he would like start to suck on the pacifier and he wouldn't. Placing on the viewer what's marked for identification states exhibit six now admitted. And uh, a little bit different angle uh, from this vantage point, uh, Officer Maxwell, uh, we can kind of see the, the baby a little better from this view. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you were in the room, you said sometimes you were in the way. Uh, kind of where were you in relation to like if we're looking at the baby from bottom feet up to head from this view. So where were you able to even be in this trauma room while they were trying to care for him? So he's on that little bed and it's kind of like squared, like a triangle or a rectangle, sorry. I was standing on his side and then after they got the IV started, I went to the other side that way I ate out of the way. I'm going to place on the viewer what's marked for identification, um, States Exhibit 7, now admitted. Okay, a uh, little bit different view. We can kind of see uh, a little bit better his face and see that pass fire a little different angle from this view. You mentioned that there was a, a bruise somewhere uh, on, was it his forehead? Yeah, it was on the right side of his forehead. I'm going to go now to uh, what's marked as um, States Exhibit 8, now admitted. Officer Maxwell, are we able in this photograph to see uh, that bruise that you were uh, telling the jury about? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and um, uh, you were able to see this uh, standing there that day uh, in, in the trauma room with this child. Yes, and I also noticed it when I, when I had him in my unit and I took him out of the towel and was putting him in the gator, I noticed that little bruise on his head and the like little scratches on his face. Now, as, as part of the investigation, uh, without telling us what somebody said, uh, did uh, you become aware that there might be some type of video related to uh, this whole incident? Yes. Uh, did you then uh, share the information you had with other officers in the investigation? Yes. Uh, do you recall who, if anybody, you I gave that information to you with the hospital police department. Detective Perez. If I could have just a moment, Your Honor. Now, after uh, you shared that information that you uh, received about the video with Detective Perez, um, did you have anything else involved with the investigation? Any further callbacks or follow-up? No, I did not. Okay. Did you just return on then with the rest of your shift uh, for that night shift you were working? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. I will pass the witness. Cross-exam. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to ask you a few questions about some of your testimony that you just gave a moment ago. So, when you first saw the baby, you said the baby was not crying? No. The baby was not making any sounds? Not that I recall. 
Okay. Um, when you first approached the baby, were there other officers around? Yes. Did, did that include Officer Biddick? Yes. Okay. And you don't remember hearing the baby cry? No. Okay. But you remember everything else that happened on this day? Okay. So you collect the baby from April model directly, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you described at length to us this a towel the baby was wrapped in. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you know if April wrapped that baby in the towel? I do not. You don't know, you don't know if the baby was wrapped in the towel prior to April having the baby? I, I don't. So you also tell us that the baby's skin was bloody? Yes. There were some bloody patches on him? And we saw that on the pictures as well. Yes. Was the baby bleeding? Not that I could tell. It was dried blood. Okay. So in that moment, it wasn't bleeding? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And now let's get to where in the hospital there were attempts at wiping the baby. Yes. Were you helping out to wipe the baby? Yes. Uh, with a baby wipes? Yeah, something in the hospital. Something like that? Yeah. Okay. But they weren't warmed up, were they? No, they were just like regular right temperature. temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were attempting to use that to wipe the baby? Yes. Were you able to successfully wipe the baby? We cleaned off one hand just enough to, but other than that, no. Okay. And let me back up just a little bit, sorry. So you take the baby, you take the baby to the ambulance when they arrive, right? Mm -hmm. You hand the baby over. Yes. And then you go to your unit. Mm -hmm. You were not in the ambulance with the baby. No. Okay. And so you don't know what was done in the ambulance for the baby. No. You don't know if there were any medications administered to the baby? No. no. Any attempts at warming him up? No, ma'am. You don't know what happened in that ambulance? No, I don't. So the next time you see the baby, he had had already some attention. Yes. Some medical care had already been provided to him. Well, I would have to assume that. I don't know. I don't know what happened in the ambulance. You just know he was in an ambulance, okay, with EMS individuals. Yes. Who would probably have provided some medical attention. I would hope so. Okay. So by the time you get to the hospital, is the baby's demeanor exactly the same as when you first saw him? Uh, I, as I recall, yes. Okay. And what you recall is that the baby was not crying when you first saw him. Not that I remember. He no. was making no sounds at all. I don't recall that, so I don't know. I don't recall that. Okay. So, to be clear, you don't recall the baby, whether or not the baby was crying when you first came Not when I first got there. I think I was a little kind of shocked at the whole situation, so if he was, and there was a lot going on, but so I don't remember if he was crying then or not. Okay, that is understandable. Okay, so now when we are at the hospital, you indicate that at some point you observed the baby's umbilical cord, mm -hmm. and you indicate that it was not a clean cut umbilical cord. Right. Okay, um, how many times have you seen a baby's cut umbilical cord? I mean, I had three children, so. You saw it at least three times. Okay, and um, at each time that you saw this umbilical cord cut, it was a clean cut. Yes. Maybe surgical scissors, Maybe. something professionally done, mm -hmm. cut by who exactly? Mine were cut by the doctors. The doctors. And so it was clean. Yes. Okay. And um, that happened in the hospital? What? The umbilical cords that you've observed in the past. What those birds oh, yeah. happened? Mm -hmm. Okay. So those birds happened in a hospital? Yes where you were receiving medical attention. Yes. Okay. And there were individuals around you at the hospital. Yes. Okay. Medical professionals. Yes. Maybe even family members. Yes. Okay. Um, and your child had immediate medical care. Yes. And so did you. Yes. So that umbilical cord was cut professionally like it's supposed to be. Right. From what you understand. Yes. Okay. So. In this situation, it looks completely different. Yes. Okay. But at the moment that you saw the baby, there was no bleeding actively happening. I don't believe so, no, because all the blood that I saw was dry. It was already dry. Yes. Okay. Was well, there also some dry blood on that towel? Mm, I don't recall. Okay. It was 
kind of a traumatic event, right? Yeah, well, and the towel was pink too, so I mean, I don't, I don't think that I paid that much attention to the, to the what was on the towel, just how it felt cold. Okay, and more importantly, making sure the baby was fine. Yes. Of course. Okay, so let's talk about this bruise that you eventually observed on the baby's head. Do you have any idea of how the bruise got there? Not yet. Okay. Um, do you like the doctors? Know how the bruise got back? No, because no. when I took him from April and I took the towel off, that's one of the first things I noticed was that little purple spot on his head. Okay. You don't know if April was able to tell how he got there? No, I didn't ask him. Okay. Uh, if I may have just a moment. Well, you said that when um, you first took the baby from April, that you're not sure if the baby was making sounds or not. No. Um, describe the scene as you pull up, you said you had lights and sirens. What else is occurring when you pull up and get out of your unit outside? What, what is the sounds and what does it look like? So we had several officers responding. So there was lights and sirens coming from everywhere. Our radios, we had a lot of radio traffic because we were asking where's the ambulance and trying to coordinate how we were going to do this and who was there and who was doing what. And there was just a lot going on. They needed to make sure that everybody that was on scene, any witnesses that were there, so there's just a lot of moving parts. They're trying to secure the scene, secure the witnesses, get the baby put together, and get the ambulance there, and it was cold also. Now, as you approach that vehicle where you, you find April, uh, is there is the door open or closed to where April is in the pickup? It was open, I believe. Was there any other officer there by the door as you approach? Uh, Biddick was somewhere in that vicinity. Was there any other officer that like got there at similar time that you did that maybe followed along with you? Do you recall another officer? I believe so. I, I think there was a couple other. I'm just, I just I couldn't tell you for sure which ones it was. Were you uh, either speaking to any other officers or are they directing you? Uh, I mean, why are you going to that door? Uh, I was going to get the baby to make sure that, you know, take the baby from whoever had him to figure out what we needed to do with it. And why was it determined that you would be the one to go and take the baby? Is my, is, does my question make sense? Why I was the one? Objection. Outside school. Just that. If I may remind you want me to do it from here, you need to approach. Yeah, approach. Okay. Okay. Approach.
Any objection to excusing Officer Maxwell? No, no, not public thanks. You're excused. Thank you. At this time, we'll take a break, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, don't discuss the case. Don't allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. Don't do any independent research about the case. Don't form any fixed opinions about the case until the case is finally submitted to you. Please stand for the jury. Who will be the state's night court witness? Your Honor, the next witness will be Dr. Susan Lyon. And is she here? Yes, she is. She's in the hall. Okay. All right. Good deal. All right. It'll be about 15 minutes. Uh, it's right now 9.17, so a little after 9.30 we'll be back. Yes, sir. Court's in recess.
may be seated. Mr. Bosco? Uh, yes, sir. Who are you next to? Seat call is Dr. Susan. Raise your right hand to be sworn. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of law? Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to members of the jury by your first and last name? Hello, my name is uh, Susan Hayek. And what is your profession? I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm an emergency room physician. How long have you worked as an emergency room physician? Uh, I'm in my 28th year. 28 years? 28, yes. Uh, what drew you to, uh, to emergency medicine? Um, you know, the, the typical adrenaline junkie, you never know what's coming through the door. Um, um, you get to see all sorts of people, all walks of life. It's just always exciting and interesting and different. And you can help people during a time of crisis. And what did it take in terms of training uh, and education in order to become a so um, I did my four years of undergrad and then did four years of medical school and then did three years of a residency and then um, started in 1995 working in emergency rooms. Uh, what was your residency specialized in, if anything? My actual residency was in internal medicine um, and at that time you could um, do internal medicine and then go on and work in an ER. Um, which is what I did because when I did my first ER res rotation as a re um, resident, I just fell in love with it. I knew that's what I needed to do. Which medical school did you graduate from? The University of Wisconsin-Madison. And during medical school, uh, how does that go? What, what, what is it that you uh, do in medical school? And oh. in first in medical school, it's the first two years are just our book work. It's uh, very intensive um, classroom stuff, um, some didactics, some interactions. But then the last two years, you're actually in the hospital doing rotations with the residents and the attending physicians. Um, you have a limited role, but you actually are doing clinical work. And then uh, University of Wisconsin, you're in New Mexico, uh, now testifying, obviously. Uh, what, if anything, brought you to the state of New Mexico? Um, I actually went from Wisconsin to Oregon to Texas, where I live. Um, and when I first moved to Texas, it was very, um, it took a long time to get a Texas medical license. So I actually ended up working half time between um, uh, Decatur, Alabama, and Carlsbad. And then I ended up staying at Carlsbad and then moved over to Hobbs. Let's talk about the field of emergency medicine. What is the objective of emergency medicine? Um, stabilization, um, discussion of whether admission or home or how that is best processed. But the, the first and foremost is the sick people that come in need to be stabilized and then medical problems addressed and either admitted or discharged. Other than your education, what tools do you use for that stabilization of lives that come into the ER? Um, well, there's different courses that we take. We take advanced trauma life support, advanced cardiac life support, uh, pediatric advanced life support. Uh, there's um, uh, CMEs, continuing medical education credits that you have to take. Um, and then there's just the years of experience of, of doing things and learning from that and learning from your peers. And you've discussed some of the other states that you practice in. Uh, what, if anything, is required to practice in a different state in the United States in medicine? Um, you need a medical license in each state. Um, and each state has different um, requirements as far as how many continuing medical education credits you need and in what they need to be in. Some need to be in trauma, some need to be in stroke, some need to be in cardiac. So it varies from state to state. Have you been licensed in these states that you've practiced medicine in? Yes. Uh, so uh, I heard Oregon, I heard Texas, I've been New uh, Mexico. Uh, Wisconsin, Oregon, Indiana, Alabama, Arizona, New Mexico. So six states that you I have been. Right? Yeah, currently I have a license in Texas and New Mexico and one in Oregon. I've let the others lapse because I'm not working there. And if I understood your uh, testimony correctly, each one of them had different requirements in order to enter the program. 
the practice of medicine. Yeah, you need to, each, each state has different requirements for you to get a medical license for their state. Now, when you are in an ER, what is the general uh, method or, or algorithm or uh, practice step by step that you do whenever a patient shows up outside a hospital and your objective is to stabilize them? Um, it really uh, kind of depends upon what the patient is presenting with. Um, if it's kind of routine things, the uh, patient will be triaged by the nurse. Um, and if we have a room available and we're not too busy, they'll be brought back into the room and then the nurse will do their initial assessment and put in the chart and then I'll go in and see the patient. Um, that's if the patient is stable and it's kind of routine kind of things and that. If someone is unstable, it's kind of like a swarm of hornets just kind of descend on the patient. I mean, we just all go in at the same time and do whatever needs to be done. Um, working together with these people that I did for three years in Hobbs and other places, you kind of start to work like a well-oiled machine. Everybody knows what everybody's going to do. But I make sure that everybody has their objective of what their job is. Um, and as I understood it, uh, you've used the term everybody to refer to other people that work in an emergency department. It's the way I understood mm -hmm. it. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, who are these other people? Is everyone a doctor? No, no. And in Hobbs, um, there's one physician on from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. There is a mid-level, which is a nurse practitioner that has varying hours um, and varying days of the week. But other than that, it's uh, physician, nurses, respiratory therapists, x-ray techs, lab technicians. Uh, does everyone work towards a common purpose uh, of stabilization of patients? Yes, they each have their different role, but yes. And what was the distinct role of you as a emergency medicine doctor? Uh, I'm the leader. Okay. I'm in charge. Uh, it would be fair to say, buck stops with you, reviewing the patient. Yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the number of patients that, that you have. Uh, you've worked in multiple states. I was counting six licenses, or counted together, rather, six licenses. How many different ERs have you worked in? Um, and if you don't have a precise number, maybe a ballpark figure. More than a dozen? More than a dozen. In terms of how many patients you would treat in one day, uh, what would a, a relatively fair uh, guesstimate be? Uh, again, depending upon where some would be, um, 10 patients a night, they're really, um, but up to 35 to 40 patients a night in a 12 hour period. And this is at over a dozen hospitals, right? six states, 28 years. Uh, would it be fair to say that it's in the hundreds or even thousands of patients that you've treated? Oh, yeah, well over thousands, yes. In terms of patients that show up to an ER, uh, are there success stories in terms of you being able to, to fulfill that mission of stabilization? Yes. And what does stabilization mean in the context of emergency? Uh, um, normal, normalization of, of vital signs, um, uh, preventing progression or deterioration of condition, progression of disease, um, finding a source and treating, um, it kind of brings all of that into it. And getting them stable enough to go to the next place, be it another hospital, be it to my hospital, or in some instances, being able to go home. In terms of other places where someone goes to, you've described in your testimony the other specializations just within the ER. Uh, what about hospitals in general in terms of referrals? Uh, do other hospitals have other specialities uh, that you refer patients to if they need continued treatment? Yes. Uh, and what is the purpose of those other uh, specialities? Well, it's um, each, each, depending upon what the disease is that you're treating or the condition, you may need a specialist in that organ system. You might need a cardiologist. You might need an ear, nose, and throat doctor. You might need a pediatrician. And if we don't have those at our hospital, they need to be transferred to another hospital that has those facilities in order to be treated definitively. Now, we've been able to discuss briefly uh, cases where folks are stabilized, they're able to either go home or uh, get treated elsewhere. Uh, what about on the other side? Are there also stories that do not end uh, in, in, in a successful outcome of someone eventually being able to go home? Yes. Uh, and what is that called when someone cannot be stabilized? Uh, what is the end result? Well, if they can't be stabilized, they usually um, expire, they pass away. With regards to the work that you do regularly in the ER, would it be fair to say that you see both trajectories of life and trajectories of death? Yes. 
and then you've seen it at least hundreds of times through your work as an emergency medicine doctor? Yes. Your Honor, at this time the, the state moves uh, for the qualification of Dr. Uh, Susan Hynek as an expert in emergency medicine. Uh, Dr. Hynek is recognized as an expert in the field of emergency medicine and may give an opinion in that area. You may proceed, Your Honor. You may. Dr. Hynek, I'm going to refer your attention to January 7th of 2022. Uh, were you working uh, in emergency medicine on that date? I was. And where were you working? I was working at uh, Covenant, uh, House Health, Covenant Health House Hospital. What was your specific role at Covenant Health Hospital on January 7th? I was the um, emergency room physician on duty for the night shift. Uh, do you, are, are, is there some variability to duties that the emergency room physician has ER to ER, or is it generally the same? It's generally the same. I mean, there's a difference about specifics of hospitals of what might be included, but for the most part, it's that's not. Um, it's all the same in the ER. You might have some other additional duties to do in the hospital itself if there's not a hospitalist on call and somebody gets sick. But for the most part, in the ER. It's all pretty standard. And what were your duties that day when you showed up to work? Uh, take care of the people who come through the door and, and treat them and um, make a proper disposition. What was your shift schedule that day? My shift schedule was 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. During the course of your time from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., did you ever come to treat a newborn baby? I did. And with regards to a newborn baby, uh, how many newborn babies did you happen to treat uh, that, that you can remember today? Uh, oh, oh, you know. You know um, from that day, from January 7th. From that day, just that one on that day. Just that one. Um, uh, Your Honor, for purposes of uh, identification, I uh, may I approach the witness with uh, energy exhibits five through eight? You may. I'm showing the witness exhibits five through eight. And take as long as you need to to uh, see uh, what is depicted in those exhibits. Uh, who is depicted in those exhibits five through eight? Uh, that's um, a baby doe. Why is it that you're able to recall a uh, baby doe what, a little over a year later? Well, uh, we don't treat many newborns that come into the ER and um, that's kind of something that sticks in your memory for a long time. When so, any patient shows up to the ER, uh, what steps have to be taken for you to assess that patient? Um, patient needs to come in, you need to look at the patient, get an overall view of what they look like. Um, a patient can tell you so much just by sitting there. You're looking at what they look like. Um, do they look like they're in distress? What's the color of their skin? What's the turgor of their skin? Are they talking to you? Are they making an effort to talk to you? Um, so there's just that initial um, gestalt, initial assessment that you have. And then there's vital signs that have to be within a certain parameter <coughs> for different age groups. Um, and then um, more on the physical exam of watching and listening to what their lungs sound like, what their heart sounds like. Do they have pain? Do they have injuries that you have to treat? Now, in your treatment of patients, are there some patient populations that are inherently more difficult uh, to perform this assessment with? Yes. Uh, what are some examples of patient populations that are difficult for you to do this assessment? Well, um, we all like to uh, have it kind of easy in the, the verbal standpoint of things. If somebody can tell me what hurts and what's going on, it's easier to kind of hone in on things. So um, by that standpoint, the people who can't really speak are difficult. Um, the elderly that are demented, uh, the people who are substance abuse and just altered mental status, and the pediatric patients and the newborn patients. Newborns, because A, they can't really localize things, they can't tell you what's going on, and it's just, um, it's a small service to work with. Now, uh, for purposes of your testimony today, I am going to be asking you questions about baby uh, uh, What were the uh, sort of background facts that you relied on that were provided to you that informed your treatment of baby doe? Uh, Could you rephrase that question? Uh, did you understand uh, at the time that you were treating baby doe any sort of background context, circumstances of why you had to treat baby doe? Oh, what, um, we got a phone call and what EMS had told us is that a newborn had been found in a dumpster 
and was very cold, and they were bringing the child in. And that's when I knew when Baby Doe arrived. Why is it important for you to have those facts as you embark on assessing a patient and stabilizing them? Well, it, it gives me the circumstances of um, things that I might anticipate if I can know um, where they were found, what the circumstances were, what led up to it. Um, as much information as you can get, what happened preceding their arrival to my ER, the better it's going to be for me to try and put a piece, uh, picture together and treat what I think is the next logical steps. Uh, did you perform any steps uh, while awaiting baby Doe's arrival to ER? Uh, we called the OB nurse down, we got a hold of the pediatrician, we got the um, warmer, we got warm blankets, we got all the stuff um, together that we thought that we would need to assess and treat. What were your initial impressions of baby Doe when baby Doe actually did arrive at the hospital? Um, I was worried. I was very worried. Um, baby Doe was blue, um, listless, not really crying, um, very, very cold to the touch, not interactive at all, um, very listless, and had a very weak, if any, cry. And we're going to take each of these in turn, uh, starting first with your description of the baby as cold. Now, I, I just noticed that you're not using the word cool or room temperature, but you're actually using the word cold. Uh, does the word cold have any sort of clinical significance when you're doing Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can see people and feel them and say, oh, they're, they're cool to the touch because they might have been out or, but when you see somebody who, like, you put their hand on them and they are cold to the touch, that's pretty significant. Um, that's exposure. That's, they've been out somewhere for a period of time in cold weather to be that, that temperature. When you have patients coming in, is there a, a, a term that you would use to describe someone who is experiencing pattern symptoms but one which would include being cold to the touch? This baby was hypothermic. Uh, with regards to temperatures, what is the normal temperature for a human being? Um, <laughs> it, can, it can vary. I mean, 97 to um, a fever is 104, so it varies, but 97 to 100. And in terms of uh, your ability to, uh, palpate's the wrong word, but to you know, touch and get a sense of temperature or body touch, uh, would you be able to determine as an expert in emergency medicine if someone's at least in the ballpark of the normal temperature? Yes, you can, you can get an idea, um, and that was not the case. This baby was cold to the touch. Uh, Follow-up question with regards to patient populations. Uh, is there anything innately different about newborns that just in and of itself would explain a newborn baby being cold to the touch. Again, I, I mean that they at that age they have um, a limited ability to regulate their temperature, so they need to be kept warm. And um, this baby being cold means that this baby was not kept warm. I mean they they they, they lose body heat fast. Um, I can't tell you what time frame, but um, they don't regulate their temperature well, so. Keeping them warm, keeping them swaddled is important in the initial period of time of life. Another condition that you uh, identified uh, with regards to baby doe was a weak cry. Uh, what significance, if any, would a weak cry indicate to you? Um, it, it, with newborns, a weak cry is kind of similar to an altered mental status in adults. Um, they don't have the energy, the power to get that lusty cry. Um, so something's going on, either like hypothermia, uh, low heart rate, low blood pressure, something is happening that is not providing adequate perfusion to this, this kiddo. So a um, very weak cry, that's, that's uh, a poor sign. You're using the word perfusion. What does that mean in sort of layman's terms? Um, blood, um, uh, blood getting to the tissues from the heart to the tissues. Um, the blood is what supplies the oxygen, the nutrients, and um, it needs to get to the vital organs and to the brain to all, for all of us to act appropriately. Um, and there's lots of different things with this um, particular child that could have, but once you start getting cold and hypothermic, um, the body starts pulling the blood in centrally to save the central organs. So um, that's why the baby was bluish to the touch. Um, 
blood wasn't really getting circulated out to the extremities because the body was trying to save the organs. Refuse what's important. Get the blood flow to the stuff that's important that we need. Uh, what is the outcome for prolonged coldness or hypothermia? Um, tissue destruction, um, organ failure, ultimately death. Uh, you also use the term uh, not interactive and listless to describe the baby. Uh, what does that mean? It's kind of along those same lines is that, um, you know, a newborn, um, while they're, they don't necessarily interact in a, um, a purposeful way, they're still interactive with their environment. They're crying, they're responding to noxious stimuli. Um, they're, they interact. This child did not. This child was very listless, was laying there. Um, did not cry really much at all when we did the vital signs, the blood pressure cuff um, was just kind of there. So again, cold, poor perfusion, not necessarily perfusing the organs appropriately. And in terms of the responsiveness uh, of a newborn to things like blood pressure cuff uh, and the other uh, steps that you were taking, tools you were using to assess this baby, uh, I take it that that is something not normal. Right, they, they don't like being messed with that much, so there's uh, usually a very vigorous cry and a lot of uh, flailing of, of extremities. You have provided some testimony with regards to the color of blue, indicating something with regards to perfusion and limited perfusion. Uh, so uh, my, my question is sort of taking all of these various components of your assessment uh, in sum, in the treatment of baby dough, uh, were you able to, uh, to doc provide any diagnosis for what this baby was experiencing? Oh, the baby was definitely experiencing um, hypothermia, and um, we still had to assess more as far as vital signs, but the biggest thing was the hypothermia that we saw. Um, we also did note that um, while the oxygen levels were, were good and the respiration seemed to be okay, the heart rate was very low, um, which again was kind of contributing to the poor perfusion, the blue color, the listlessness. And let's talk a little bit about baselines for things like heart rate for a newborn. Uh, what was this newborn's heart rate? Um, I think 50 to 60. And do you actually uh, prepare reports when you're uh, you know, documenting uh, what is going on? With yeah, the there's an ER record. Uh, would it be fair to say that a review of your report, you'd be able to testify with certainty as regards to the pulse of, of this baby? So on the, um, the nursing documentation, um, at 2002, the pulse was 75. Now, is 75 a normal heart rate? Not for a newborn. Uh, what would you expect for a newborn baby? I would expect more in the 120s to 140s, maybe even up into the 150s. If they're stressed, they can go into the 150s, 60s. And so I'm tracking about 45 beats per minute that this baby was off. Mm -hmm. At least, yes. Uh, is that something that uh, would concern you as an emergency medicine uh, doctor? <coughs> yes. Oh, uh, I can retrieve you. Yes. Here you go. Uh, and why would that concern you? Um, there's a, there's a, a cutoff level of a newborn's heart rate that when it gets below a certain point, um, even if they have a pulse, you start CPR because they're, as we would say, they're circling the drain. Um, um, bradycardia or slow heart rate is a, bit, is a bad prognostic thing for a kid and you need to address that because otherwise they'll potentially go into cardiac arrest. Now you used a, a term circling the drain. Right. Um, I take it that's not a medical term of art? No, it's not a medical term, but I mean it gives you again the whole um, kind of the gestalt picture of you're really worried. There's a whole lot of things that are happening and if you don't do something, they're gonna get worse. This, this patient is gonna deteriorate. And with reference to circling the drain, what happens uh, if a patient goes through the drain or down the drain? Then they've usually passed away. 
Um, so we try, obviously, to do everything we can not to uh, get to that point. We uh, get the interventions that we need to um, and hope that they are successful. Were you able to get a precise temperature for this trial? Maybe a I was not. When I was in the room, they were attempting to do a rectal temperature on this child, and the temperature would not even um, read on the digital thermometer, and that means that the temperature was below 80. Below 80 degrees. Uh, is there any sort of significance to a temperature that is 80 versus upper 90s? It's profound hypothermia. This patient needs to get warmed um, and needs to get more warm fluids, warm body. Uh, you use the term profound hypothermia. Are there different degrees of hypothermia? Yes. What are they? Um, I mean, there's there's mild hypothermia, there's moderate hypothermia, there's severe hypothermia, there's profound hypothermia. A lot of times profound and severe kind of are in the same ballpark or same area. Now, in your years of experience, I mean, now we're looking at 28 years of experience in emergency medicine, uh, up to thousands of patients that you've treated. Have you ever had a temperature so low that it could not be read by the thermometer? No. Was that something that concerned you as the emergency medicine doctor? Yes. What were you concerned about? I was um, I was concerned that this baby was going to die. Uh, are you able to uh, to tell the jury what the likelihood of this baby not surviving would have been had you not uh, embarked on this course of medical treatment for the baby? This baby would have died if we would have not intervened and um, resuscitated. Um, I have a follow-up question for you, just in terms of, of, of my thought process that, that you, you can shine a light on. Um, when people show up to the uh, ER uh, with an injury, say, wound on their hand, uh, you're able to, to recognize it as an injury, I, I would take it. Yes. Uh, is hypothermia something that could be an injury, or could be considered as an injury to you? Well, yeah, it, it can be. I mean, it's definitely um, an insult to a whole lot of different organ systems, so it technically could be classified as an injury. Uh, and in the context of the uh, potential for an injury of uh, hypothermia, uh, what did you have to do to treat this baby, uh, baby uh, uh, while he was in the ER? Um, the, um, we had to obviously warm the, the child, um, which involved being under the heat lamp, uh, heated blankets, heated IV fluids. Um, that was the, the biggest thing. We provided um, supplemental oxygen, and we tried to warm that too. Um, and that was the warming part of it. Uh, for purposes of the warming, uh, do you have to treat profound hypothermia in a manner that is different from mild hypothermia or other? Your initial, um, initial in, your initial um, things that you do are, are very much the same. Um, and if they don't respond to that, then there's other things that could potentially be done, but not at our small hospital. Okay. Uh, what are the other things that could be done, but beyond uh, the, the Covenant House? I actually, outside of my area of expertise, I mean, it would have to be a, a pediatric specialist of, um, they would have to decide what that could be. But I know that there's other things that can be done. But for us, it was just, warm fluids, warm oxygen, and external warming. Uh, uh, would it be fair to say that there's other things that other specialties could potentially do for yes. a patient like baby down? Yes. Uh, did, in fact, that referral get made so that other specialists can take over? Uh, yes. I contacted um, Covenant Children's Hospital and arranged for um, transfer um, pretty quickly after baby doe arrived because I knew it was not something that our hospital could take care of. And what in particular uh, uh, did your hospital not have that, that you believe would lead to a successful outcome? We didn't have a neonatologist. We didn't have a neonatal ICU. Uh, we don't have, actually, a lot of the nursing staff doesn't take care of even peds patients. They don't have the training. So this definitely needed to go to a specialist. And if there were potential problems with infection or sepsis, uh, this child needed to be where the neonatal specialists were. Now we've talked about the uh, brachycardia, I believe yeah. is the term, please correct me. Brachycardia. 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 Uh, we've also talked about the profound hypothermia. 
Uh, you've used a term that I don't think I've heard through the course of, of the direct so far, which is sepsis. Uh, did you believe there's a risk of sepsis to this trial? Yes, sepsis being um, overwhelming infection. And there's a couple of reasons for that is, again, um, at this age, uh, a newborn's immune um, system is not, it's not very strong. Um, granted, there's still mom's antibodies, but um, newborns have a um, limited ability to fight off infection. Uh, and to compound that, um, the child came in with um, EMS actually um, clamped the umbilical cord. Um, EMS reported to me, so when the child came in to me, the umbilical cord was clamped. But they reported to me, EMS did that, they clamped it. So the umbilical cord was not clamped, and this is a direct conduit of the bloodstream to the outside world. Um, so there's a risk of infection. Uh, and with regards to a direct conduit to the outside world, uh, did you uh, take any steps to treat the baby for the fact that the baby's umbilical cord was open to the world, all that bacteria in it? Um, they, the um, baby got uh, two different IV antibiotics, two um, kind of broad-spectrum antibiotics to cover sepsis in a newborn. Uh, did you recall what the two antibiotics were that you ordered? Ampicillin and gentamicin. And what is the purpose of, of those uh, particular uh, antibiotics? They're just broad-spectrum antibiotics that kind of cover everything until something, uh, if something grew out of the blood or the urine, then you could kind of hone your antibiotic treatment. But at this point, you're just treating some um, broad-spectrum. You're trying to get all the bugs that you can get covered that might be causing the problem. And then one thing I'd like to permission to retrieve is that it's 5-3. One that I want to publish for, for you and for the jury for this next question is uh, in Exhibit 5, uh, what is this dark colored uh, substance that is on the exterior of the baby doe's body? And that there's um, some degree of blood, dry blood. Um, it also um, could potentially be um, blood from the placenta and birth if the child wasn't blocked. Um, washed off. So it's hard to tell exactly um, I, uh, whose blood it was, um, but there was definitely dry blood all over the child. And when a baby's in, in, the, uh, in the ER and circumstances like this, and, uh, actually let me withdraw that question. Have you ever treated a baby in circumstances like this, you know, dumpster, outside in the cold, being a newborn? No. Uh, 28 years of experience and you've not seen that specific fact pattern? No. Um, then I guess I can't ask you questions about uh, sort of the cleaning process for, for a baby, but uh, would it be fair to say your focus was not on having to uh, clean off the baby? Correct. Uh, what was your focus on? And my focus was stabilizing the child so we could get um, <clears throat> to definitive care. So uh, addressing the vital signs, addressing perfusion, getting the baby warm. Um, making sure we did all the things that we could to uh, get them stable for transfer. Where was the closest hospital that you believe would have the tools necessary uh, Love to treat this job? Uh, which hospital in particular? Covenant, Children's, Women's and Children's. Uh, when you made the uh, referral, were they able to uh, make arrangements with you for transfer of the child? Yes, and they sent their transport team. Uh, how do transfers happen between hospitals? Or between these two hospitals in particular? Um, I talked to the nursing, uh, the um, unit clerk, they make the phone calls um, to the transfer center. The transfer center gets a hold of the doc that I need. The doctor calls me back. I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the doctor. The doctor accepts or declines, in this case accepts, gives any of their recommendations of what they would like to have happen. And then uh, transport gets arranged, and in this case, um, Due to the size of the child and um, the um, conditions and everything around it, we all decided it was best if they sent their specialized transport team. Okay. Uh, and then just some uh, uh, final series of questions with regards to what we uh, actually see uh, in these photographs. Uh, I think I'm going to publish what's been entered as Exhibit 6. Uh, could you explain for the jury what that is? 
the, 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 looks like the pacifier. Uh, what about this? That is um, kind of a heart rate monitor. Uh, what about down here? That's the pulse ox to tell me what the oxygen levels are. So oxygen levels, mm -hmm. heart rate. Mm -hmm. uh, would this have been the, the instrument from which you were able to determine the uh, bradycardia? Bradycardia. Bradycardia. So yes. Uh, what about this? That's a little arm board to keep the the IVs in that arm, and that um, arm board is there to keep the arm um, straight, so there's no bending. We basically so we can keep the IV intact. For the gentamicin, 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 and the ampicillin, ampicillin, was it administered intravenously? It was. Uh, when you were providing your testimony earlier on direct about the baby's responsiveness to uh, the blood pressure monitor. Uh, what about the baby's response when the IV? There, there wasn't really much of a response. There was a little weak cry, but there wasn't um, a significant um, response. Okay. Uh, and then what about this? Uh, blood pressure cuff. Blood pressure. Um, and then in the center of the baby, uh, not the diaper, but this white uh, square that appears to above it. What, what is that? Event? That's just a dressing on the um, umbilical cord. Um, and actually the pediatrician had uh, put a, an IV into um, the umbilical um, vessel. And then is there anything that I missed uh, within the four corners of this picture uh, with regards to uh, treatment of the baby? Yeah. No. Uh, I'm going to publish what's been entered as eight. Uh, over here, what, if anything, is this clear looking? Um, that's what we call an, uh, it's a, a bag valve mask. So um, the, the part closest towards the baby's head is um, basically that mask would go over the nose if we needed to assist with respirations or if the baby stopped breathing initially. So um, that goes over the nose, uh, kind of make sure there's a, a seal. And then the back part of it is a bag that provides oxygen. Um, it's hooked up to the wall, and that bag provides a push of oxygen to breathe. Why, if at all, would you have this tool uh, right next to the baby? Um, we didn't know what was coming in. We didn't know what kind of respiratory status the child was going to have as we kind of um, made preparations for everything and anything. Um, so. If we needed to assist with respirations, if the oxygen levels were low, that was right there close by, so we could intervene if needed. Fair to say you want to be prepared. Uh, and that was a little bit of an incomplete sentence, so be prepared to save someone's life. Be prepared to save someone's life and be prepared for everything and anything that might walk in. Uh, was this a baby that needed saving? Yes. Uh, you're on one moment to confer with counsel, but. Uh, no further questions on direct Thank you. Cross exam? Yes. It's, it was definitely um, a, a red flag because um, you don't get, uh, from my instances now, I haven't, I've delivered a, probably about 15 babies over my career as an ER doctor. Um, I usually don't see uh, trauma or, or bruising around the head unless there's um, a pressure applied, like a forceps delivery or a vacuum suction, or if there's uh, bruising is always, to me, a sign of, of trauma. So. Um, when I saw that, which I initially did not see because the baby was blue in color, but as, as the child got warmer and painted up, we noticed that bruising. Um, it was definitely something that was brought to the attention of the attending physician in Covenant because we weren't going to 
it needed to be addressed, to look at, to see if there was something more, if there was something underneath there. Was there a skull fracture? Was there bleeding on the brain? Um, but we weren't going to delay transport to get the child to the definitive care by addressing that because the child was very stable for us. But that bruising is something that needed to be further evaluated. Okay. So you referred that to Covenant, and that's in Lovett. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, you described the possibility of a reinforcement birth mm -hmm. or something like that, too. That I mean, that's, that's what I have seen in the past. I, the only time I've seen bruising on a skull is either a forceps delivery, a vacuum delivery, or trauma. Those are the big ones. Trauma, maybe the baby was born and kind of just fell out the floor. Maybe. Something like that, or, so, yeah. Okay, that could be. That, that could be, yes, that could happen. Maybe a bathroom floor at home? Any, anything where the baby's head impacts something could cause that bruising. Okay, um, and did you get any information at all subsequently as to the cause of this bruising? I did not. Or maybe any um, subsequent, any deeper issues caused by the bruising? I have not. I have not really heard much of anything about um, follow-up. Okay. Um, so, and when you did meet the baby, you said there was dry blood on him, right? Okay. And you did not observe any bleeding from him, though, did you? I did not see any bleeding, but um, as I said, the umbilical cord, which definitely, when it's separated from the placenta, the umbilical cord bleeds. It was not bleeding at the time I saw him, or when EMS got him, when I saw him, because it had already been clamped. But when EMS saw him, the cord was not clamped, but it was still not bleeding. But there is definitely a potential of that being a source of bleeding to cover the child. Okay, what about just being born? Yes. Could that be, could that cause some That can cause some dry blood, yep. Okay, so all that blood on the baby's body could have just been from being birth. It could have been. No bleeding. Could have been. Okay. Um, in this case, you described to us hypothermia and how it affected this baby specifically. Um, you did also indicate that you did also indicate that the baby's oxygen levels happened to be okay by the time you were treating him. Correct. Yes, the the baby was breathing adequately and had normal oxygen levels um, that did not require us to intervene with artificial respirations or intubation. The baby was breathing well. Okay. So by the time you transported the baby to love it, the baby was stabilized. Yes. And um, you couldn't transfer him if he wasn't stabilized, correct? Um, correct. Okay. Even regular newborns who didn't have any trauma, there's some guidelines. There's, there's, there's guidelines. Um, the emergency medicine sometimes is you stabilize to the best of your ability and sometimes you have to get them somewhere where the specialist is because that's what's going to save them, even if they're not 100% stable. But this child was stabilized, had a better heart rate, um, a better blood pressure, a better temperature, and was pink and cooing and interactive. Now, um, other than this baby, if you had to have other babies that you that, that come up to you at the at the emergency services, have you had other babies transported to Lubbock for uh, further attention? Uh, define babies for me. Are we talking newborn on the day they were born, or newborn in the first twenty-eight days of their life? Well, or... well the first twenty-eight days. Yes, I have had to transfer other um, newborns to uh, Covenant in Lubbock. So there are other critical conditions that could happen to a newborn other than hypothermia. Correct. That could lead for that that would create a necessity for them to go to a different facility where they could get a higher level of care. Correct. Okay. And the facility that you typically use, at least from around here, is Covenant in London, correct? Correct. Um, is it possible that this child, if he were born under normal conditions, could still have health conditions that needed that further high level of care? Could you rephrase or re-ask the question? Yes. Um, is it possible that other babies born under normal conditions 
non-hypothermic could have reason to be transferred for a higher level of care. Yes. Now, the document that you used to refresh your recollection a moment ago, um, whose documentation is that? The documentation that I saw um, it entails the, um, the ER visit. So the nurses chart on that, um, RTs can chart on that, and I chart on that. So okay. there's a number of people who chart on that medical record. Okay. Um, and so there is some assessment in that medical record that indicated the, the, the date was January 7th, correct? Correct. Okay. And the time the baby arrived at your hospital was about 7.59, 8 p.m.? So yes. Okay. And so the documentation in this in this document that you reviewed would have started around that time, correct? Correct. Okay. And like you said, not all the information was included by yourself. Correct. Okay. So the people who put information in that would include pretty much everybody who worked with you and the baby? Is that um, yes. Nursing staff, um, respiratory therapy, myself. Um, they all have different ways to get into the chart, but those are the people who could definitely um, charts and um, provide documentation of what their their role was in the treatment. Okay, and so part of the information in this chart indicated that at 2020, which would be 8:20 p.m., um, that there was appears in no apparent distress was the description of the baby. Was that something that you inputted, or could that be some other person? It could have been somebody else. Depends upon where it was in the chart. Okay. Um, do you recall inputting that kind of information personally? Um, I I don't at the top off the top of my head. Um, it could have been my charting, um, okay. but I hard to say. Um, if I show you that document saying what the state used to refresh your recollection, would you be able to remember who, I if you would yourself at least, who documented that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach your witness? You may. Thank you. Uh, two. Sorry. Second page. Here. So looking down at the bottom of that page, are you able to recall if you... That is not my documentation. Okay. All right. I will take that back from you. Thank you. Okay. So that would have been documentation of another medical professional. Correct. I believe that was the nurse. Okay. And um, the nurse was also involved in taking care of the baby, correct? Correct. Okay. So the nurse made observations of the baby as well. Correct. Okay. Now, the baby was transferred from your hospital to uh, Covenant in Lubbock. And again, looking at this documentation, looks like that happened at about, at this time, 108, early, early, uh, the very next morning, right? I, I um, don't recall off the top of my head what time it was. Okay. If I showed you on yes. this document again, could it yeah. help? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I will have you look at it, and I will just ask to make sure if your uh, recollection has been refreshed, and then I'll re-ask the questions. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, may I approach your honor? Right. Okay. So I'm uh, inquiring specifically about the discharge assessment. After reviewing that document, are you able to refresh your recollection as to the events around this time? Yes. And maybe the time that the baby was um, transported? Um, the child left the emergency room at okay. 10 minutes after. The doctor, if you would just a moment. Oh. Sorry, there's some rules to okay. uh, <laughs> doing this thing. So I will take that back from you and ask you the question. All right, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so about what? The state has no objection to the expert being able to use the report for purposes of these questions. Okay, thank you. 
All right. So at what time was the baby transported from your hospital to Covenant in Lebanon? At 10 minutes after midnight. 10 minutes after midnight. And at that time, was there a discharge assessment inputted into this report? The um, nursing staff may have done that. I had finished my charting. Um, I continued to check in on the child to make sure that the child was stable until the transport team arrived. Okay, and based on the documentation, like you said, including what the nurses did document here, it indicates that the patient was awake, alert, and oriented. Is that correct? As much as a newborn can be oriented, yes. Okay. Baby was awake and alert. All right. Also indicates that there were no cognitive or other functional deficits noted. Not that we could see at that time. All right. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Any redirect? Uh, yes, Ron. Doctor, you were asked about uh, various uh, possibilities regarding newborns. Uh, when you're treating an actual patient in real life, uh, do you consider just possibilities or something else? Right. Oh, wait, we always think about possibilities of what potentially could, but it's based upon what the facts are in front of us and what the potential outcomes could be from what we're seeing in front of us. And in terms of the patient that you had uh, in front of you, were you looking at a patient where it was just okie dokie, everything's going fine? No, I mean, as I said, the initial assessment that, that this was a critically ill uh, newborn, that was very hypothermic and bradycardic, and um, the uh, interventions definitely improved things, so, um, when the child left, the child was was much improved. Um, and I have a question about your use of the term interventions. Interventions by who? By the, the emergency staff. Everybody. The, uh, myself, the nursing staff, what I ordered, the antibiotics given, everything that we did to um, improve this child's clinical uh, course. You also indicated on cross-examination that, that you were not going to be delaying transport did I hear you correctly? We yeah we didn't um, we didn't feel that there was anything showing that required um, a CT scan be done and the uh, attending physician also agreed with me that they would take care of that there if it needed to be done. And then with reference to the medical uh, documentation you asked several questions about how the patient is doing. Uh, I'd like to refer your attention fair to say, uh, in your review of the patient, uh, that the patient's symptoms were severe? severe. Yes. Uh, and yes. I have a question as to whether that particular fact was uh, documented as well in the medical documentation for Shannon on Cross. Commission to approach the witness room. Uh, and just directing your attention because it's a, a lot of people. Yes, it's documented that at the worst the symptoms were severe in the emergency department, the symptoms were unchanged. And was that because the conditions uh, that the baby doe was experiencing were in fact severe based off of your observations? Correct. They were severe when the child arrived and they continued to be severe upon initial evaluation in the emergency room. Okay. Uh, no further questions, John. Anything further? Ms. Nothing further. Any questions from the jury? Any objection to excusing Dr. Hunter? Not from the state, Your Honor. No objection from the defense. You're excused, ma'am. Thank you. Call your next witness. State will call Rebecca Morley. Uh, Your Honor, permission to approach the uh, witness stand. I just want to confirm that we don't have any documents in the witness this morning.
swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of law. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. Please state your name for the jury. My name is Rebecca Morgan. Where are you employed? At the Hobbs Police Department. And what is your position with the Hobbs Police Department? I'm a crime scene tech. And uh, when did you begin working for the Hobbs Police Department as a crime scene tech? In August of 2012. Now, uh, prior to you beginning uh, with the Hobbs Police Department in 2012, uh, what was your uh, when you start with, what was your education uh, at that point? In my education, I had an associate's degree in um, medical technology. I was a medical lab tech. Now I'm in the military. Um, and I did that for 20 years. When you began as a crime scene tech, uh, <coughs> did you uh, have specialized training uh, that you had to go through uh, at the time you started, like or before you began? How did that work? Uh, I started out as on-the-job training, and then I went to a forensic academy and learned how to use my camera properly, um, collect latent prints, uh, process crime scenes and stuff, and then I went to the National Forensic Academy in Knoxville, Tennessee, and um, learned a whole lot more. And so, um, in addition to being a crime scene tech, do you... Uh, have over the years then developed uh, areas of specialty uh, that you have those services available uh, for cases to be worked by the Hobbs Police Department? Uh, yes, I'm a latent print examiner. I can identify latent prints and testify in court. Um, I do trajectory analysis, blood stain pattern analysis, uh, um, crime scene reconstruction. Now, uh, Explain generally for the jury, uh, as a crime scene tech, what are your duties uh, when you're called out to work uh, any type of scene? Um, whenever I respond, I get, I call it a rundown. The, the um, officer or detective that is on the scene will tell me what, what the scene is about, whether it's a shooting or a burglary or whatever it is, and um, tell me um, the areas that I need to um, photograph, process, collect the evidence, um, whatever it is that I need to do on the scene. Do you have uh, certain uh, materials or a kit that you keep together ready to be able to uh, work in any scene? I uh, have my latent print, um, fingerprint kit. I have my DNA collection kit, a trajectory kit, and then we have a Faro that does the 3D scans for imaging, for diagramming. You mentioned uh, a camera yes. uh, and taking photographs. Um, is there a certain kind of camera or certain types of things you have to do uh, when taking photographs, it seems? Um, the, uh, you take a, the uh, photographs, you take an um, overall photograph, and then you, zoom, um, you move in a little closer to take a mid-range photograph. And then you move in and take a close-up photograph of whatever the um, item of interest is. And sometimes you will even narrow it down and take a, um, a specific area of that item that there might be something that of interest on it. Now, when you uh, are working on a scene, uh, are you working alone or is there a team of other crime scene techs, officers? Uh, just kind of explain that for the jury. It depends on the size of the scene. Sometimes it's just the one crime scene tech and one detective. Um, if there's a whole lot of scenes involved, that could be everybody that's on our floor, the entire CID department. Um, we usually have police officers. That so, um, tell us about like protocols. I uh, you talked a little bit about like how you take photographs, but what if you find an item that you have to collect? What are the protocols for how it's collected to protect its integrity? Um, every item that we collect on scene is placed in a separate bag or envelope, whichever it happens to be, um, whatever the size is. And then we take it to the station. And if it's wet, we hang it into a dry locker to dry and keep everything separated. 
and then um, it's um, placed back into a bag and sealed with evidence tape and then logged into evidence. Does the, uh, this process involve uh, use of uh, gloves uh, to uh, protect yourself as well as protect the integrity of the items? Yes, I go through a lot of gloves. I change gloves. Um, if the DNA is the, um, it, the item in question, I change gloves between each item. Now, uh, you mentioned that it depends on the size of the scene. Uh, what you may need and how many people you may need. Uh, is there a, a protocol, let's just talk one detective, one crime scene tech for now, uh, for if you're finding items, uh, what you do first, where you begin? Is it photography? Is it uh, marking? How, how does that work? I photograph everything as it is when I arrive on the scene first, and then after I photograph it, um, I place not always, but I place evidence markers against uh, close to the items that are of interest, and then I photograph again everything in, um, as it was, and then I start doing the mid-range and close-up photographs. Now, when it comes time to collect items, uh, if you're the crime scene tech working that scene, are you the one that physically then, okay, I bag things, I throw them in envelopes, I take them and I secure them inside the vehicle? Correct. I. Is there any type of uh, documentation occurring about any kind of list, so to speak, of the items as they're collected? Um, if we're doing a search warrant, there is a return of inventory sheet that the items are listed on. Um, otherwise, I do I create my own list whenever there's not a search warrant and um, put the item number with the item that I collected so that it makes it easier for me to type my reports. Now, um, once you uh, have worked the scene, gathered any items, photographs, and you're going to take these back to the police department, uh, once you get back with the items, is there ever an opportunity for you to take items out and then photograph them again once you're back uh, at the department? Uh, yes, we have a large table that we can put pressure paper on and lay the items out individually and photograph them in detail. And why would there be a need to do that? I mean, you found it at a location, you photographed it, you collected it. Why would you want to photograph it again uh, in, in that type of setting? In the controlled environment, sometimes you can see more um, things on that. Um, if it's clothing that has tears or rips or blood patterns on it, then you can see the um, patterns better when we lay them out flat. Now, uh, once you have items and they're uh, uh, ready to be what I'm going to just refer to as logged into evidence. Uh, explain what that means and what happens to the items when you got back to the police department. Um, after I get back to the police department, if I re-photograph them, um, sometimes, don't always, but sometimes I re-photograph the items, then I place them in their packages, seal them up with evidence tape, and I make a sheet that um, lists all of them item, um, individually. And I take them across the hall to our evidence department where they're logged in and secured into the um, evidence lockers. Now, you mentioned that you assign a number to an item and, it, and you describe it. Uh, when you bring it back and you give it to evidence, and they are now going to be the custodians of those items. Do they just use, do they use your number? Does that make sense? Yes. No, they don't use my number. They have their own numbering system. And if it gets sent to the state lab, it has a third numbering system that goes with it. So that sometimes there's up to three or four numbers that are associated with one item. Now, um, after you've processed uh, the scene, you've collected, turned everything up, do you prepare a report uh, that covers what work you did and anything uh, you collected? Yes, I do. Now, um, Let's talk um, specifically about uh, the incident that occurred on uh, January 7th of 2022. Did you become involved in an investigation where uh, a baby boy had been located in a, a dumpster near the Broadway Mall? Yes, I did. Uh, when, if you recall, did you first become involved? Oh, gosh. I 
forgot the time. It was after six in the evening. It okay. was the early evening. Were you uh, still working or were you called out, so to speak? I was called out. I was at home. Uh, and when you uh, responded, uh, just kind of go through with the jury, where did you respond to first? Um, I went to behind the mall, um, Brig Outfitters. There was three dumpsters lined up behind it. Near the dumpster that was closest to the business, there was a black trash bag lying on the ground. And I went over and photographed the trash bag as to where it was lying on the ground. And I uh, collected it and uh, placed it into my unit. And then I went inside to see if we could lo locate video of the incident. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the photographs that you took uh, at, at that dumpster. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Did you take, like what you explained, you took far, mid, close? Yes, correct. Uh, and um, you then uh, collected that bag. Did you collect anything else from that dumpster? No, I just photographed the dumpster and then collected only the trash bag. Uh, Your Honor, I have uh, what's been marked for identification uh, photographs. States Exhibits 15, 16, and 17. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I got copies. <coughs> oh, no objection. States Exhibits 15 through 17 are admitted without objection and may be published. Now it's been marked for identification states exhibit 15 has been. Miss Morley, are you able to see states exhibit uh, 15 on the monitor at the witness stand? Yes. Uh, are you able to recognize what's depicted uh, in that photograph? It is a waste management dumpster with a black trash bag lying on the ground in front of it. And um, is this the yeah. I'm sorry, Your Honor. We keep wait, what's happened on the screen. We've never had that happen and we're making it make the little red and blue. There's a you can clear it. We, we, that's what we just did. Yeah. But I apologize. It, we're not don't usually have that. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay. So Miss Worley, uh, I'm sorry, let me just take you back. Uh, you took this photograph. Correct. Uh, and uh, just explain for the jury uh, what you were seeing as you're there uh, that evening uh, taking this photograph. Um, I just saw the trash bag lying next to the ground. There was a police officer standing next to it. Whenever I got there, I made him move over. Um, and uh, then there was three dumpsters in a row. The dumpster closest to the buildings is the one that the trash bag was lying next to. Now let's go next to um, what's identified on uh, Mark the State's Exhibit 16, now admitted. And Ms. Morley, uh, what are we seeing in State 16? That is the trash bag. I'm standing almost over it, I'm taking a photograph of it. And can we see? Uh, for the vantage points, we can understand where, where you're standing. Uh, we can see the edge, I'll write direct to my pen, of the dumpster, is that what that is? Correct. Okay. And then we'll go to uh, what's marked for identification states, Exhibit 17, now admitted. Exhibit 17, now Uh, Ms. Morley, you were able to see uh, States uh, 17. Yes, ma'am. Orianus, what are we looking at in this photograph? Where are we at? I just leaned over into the dumpster and took a picture of what the contents inside the, the waste management dumpster were. So this is you with your camera over on top of the dumpster? Correct. Now, you said that... Uh, 
the next thing we did at this location was to go inside the business of Rig Outfitters regarding possible video. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and did you find that there was a video uh, in, in this matter? Yes, there was. Uh, and was there any uh, one assisting uh, with that location of uh, finding relevant video? Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so it was the owner of Rig Outfitters, Joe, and I have to work his last name, I'm sorry, Embriali. And so was he assisting with that? Yes. Uh, and was video uh, ultimately then recovered? Yes. Uh, did you have anything to do with collecting and taking that video back uh, to the Hobbs Police Department? I gave Mr. Embriali a thumb drive to, to put the video on and then I went to the hospital. Why did you go to the hospital? To photograph the baby boy. Now, uh, do you know what time of uh, day uh, it might have been uh, when you went to the hospital? I was getting into late evening. And uh, how were things when you arrived at the hospital? What was happening? What was happening? Well, I mean, it was the regular ER. Um, the baby was in trauma two on a baby bed that had the light on him. Um, he had tubes and all the medical stuff, the oxygen, the heart monitor, all that kind of stuff was on him. He had an IV. He had dried blood all over him. Um, and he was moving his arms and legs. He had a little bruise right here on his forehead. And I'm going to take you to um, State's Exhibit um, 5. Uh, it's already been admitted. Uh, places in the viewer. Uh, do you recognize this photograph? Yes, I took that photograph. And uh, were you describing uh, the uh, intervention items and how the baby appeared? Uh, uh, is that this how the baby appeared to you when, when you arrived at the hospital? Yes, it is. I'm going to go to uh, State's Exhibit 8. Already in there. And uh, you were referencing um, a, a bruise on the forehead, and you had kind of touched your forehead when you made this yes. to the jury. Uh, do you see what you could see of the baby in this photograph? Yes, the little bruise that's on his forehead. Now, um, did you do the same, so to speak, with the photographs at the hospital with the baby, uh, the process of trying to take a far away, uh, uh, different angles uh, of the baby? I took different angles, but I did take a whole lot of real close-ups other than the one bruise. Now, after um, you took uh, photographs, uh, at, well, let me ask you, you took photographs, did you collect anything at the hospital? There was a pink towel that he had been wrapped up in, and I collected that pink towel from the medical staff that were there. Can you describe uh, that pink towel, uh, how it appeared to you at its best, you recall? It was wet and had um, blood um, on it. And when you collect a wet item like that, you talked a little bit earlier about what you would do with a wet item. Do you recall uh, what you did with that item once you got back to the Hobbs Police Department? Yes, I took it to the um, Hobbs Police Department, hung it in a dry locker to dry where it's secure in an area where it can air dry. And uh, did you, uh, and then it would go through, once it was dry, would it go through the normal process of being placed in some type of packaging and being put into evidence? Correct. Um, was, did that complete what work you were doing at the hospital that night? Yes. Now, uh, where, where, if anywhere, did you uh, then next become involved uh, in this investigation uh, 
Did you go any, to any other location as part of this investigation? Um, I went back to the station and opened the trash bag up the, to see the contents inside it. And then I photographed all the items that were inside the trash bag. Your Honor, I have uh, photographs, states exhibits 18 through 22. All right. Thanks. No objection, Judge. States exhibits 18 through 22 are received without objection and may be published to the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Placing on the Bureau of What's now marked for identification admitted States Exhibit 18. Okay, Ms. Morley, tell the jury what are we seeing in States Exhibit 18. That's the contents inside one of the, the black trash bags inside um, that I collected from in front of the dumpster. And what kind of items are we seeing that you found in this trash bag? Uh, there's water bottles. Just household trash, receipt, um, makeup wipes, food wrappers. Now, um, was this uh, one bag that you found? No. Uh, describe what you found. There was a black trash bag, and inside it was the second black trash bag. And then inside the second black trash bag was an American Eagle shopping bag. I'm going to show you now what's been marked States Exhibit 19, now admitted. States Exhibit 19, now on the viewer. Tell the jury what we're seeing. That is the American Eagle shopping bag that was in the top part of the, the trash bags, the black trash bags. And was there items inside of this white trash bag? Yes. I uh, and uh, let me go now then to um, States Exhibit uh, 20 now admitted. Okay, Miss Morley. Now we have States Exhibit 20. Uh, Orianus, what bag is this? This is the American Eagle bag. And what are we seeing? What did you find in it? And again, there's household trash, there's soda cans, there's um, water bottles, there's makeup wipes, there's discarded wrappers. Um, that, there's a gift bag in there. Did you, uh, as you said, sometimes you do, you, you lay things out and you photograph them. Did you have any reason to do that in this case? Yes. Uh, and did you take items out and then photograph? I did. Going to now go to States Exhibit 21, now admitted, person in the group. And what are we looking at in States 21? That's the items I removed from the American Eagle bag. And let's go to now States Exhibit 22, now admitted, placing on the viewer. And what are we looking at on stage 22? We're looking at a prescription box for an albuterol inhaler for Alexis Avila that was inside the American Eagle bag.
Your Honor, uh, I now have uh, marks for identification of uh, physical items states at 35. States Exhibit 35 is received into evidence and may be opened and published if you desire. Thank you. Court's indulgence uh, would uh, spend a minute. Will we be permitted to have uh, Detective Perez go ahead and open it? Uh, he's got gloves that are the right size for him. Uh, is that okay? That's all right. Okay. Any objection? No, sir. Okay. You may open the bag. Now that we uh, have uh, seen that a little bit, explain a little bit about the packaging on the outside. Uh, kind of explain for the jury, uh, there's a brown uh, evidence bag, and then it's got like some white labels. So explain how the process for the jury. Hey, this is one of our larger um, evidence bags. This label is one that I filled out myself. It has my initials and name. It has the case number, the date, the description of the item, and then my initials and what it is. 
this is the evidence um, labeled from the evidence department. It also gives it another item number and all the description descriptors are on it as well. It was sealed with evidence tape. My initials and date date were all over this tape before you tore it off of here. And then it was sealed and given to evidence just like that. Thank you. Uh, now, um, after you uh, had brought the trash bag back, uh, taken everything out, photographed it, and then it was sealed in the manner that we see it in today's State's Exhibit 35, uh, what, if any, further investigation were you involved in as uh, crime scene tech in this case? Um, we did a search warrant on McKenzie at the uh, Ms. Avila's residence. And uh, did you go there with uh, anyone else with the Hobbs Police Department? Um, Detective Perez and Sergeant um, Jaronski. And what were, uh, do you recall the address uh, on the Kansas City that you went to? 80, 80-something. Okay, Eight, 800 block of 800 Kansas. block, okay. yes. Uh, when you uh, got there, kind of explain, you know, what, what you did, how you go through the process for the jury. Um, initially, after the house is cleared, we go in and photograph it. And then Detective Perez did the searching, and as he had located items of interest, I photographed them and then collected some items. And um, tell the jury, just kind of describe, um, by that point, you had an idea of maybe some type of things you might be looking for. So what did you find when you got uh, inside the residence that became of interest uh, to the investigation? Um, there was blood located in the bathroom, and then the bedroom that on the uh, southwest side of the residence was Miss Avila's um, bedroom, and we located quite a few items that um, had blood on them. And um, let's start with the bathroom. Um, did you take photographs uh, in the bathroom of what you were observing? Yes. Um, Your Honor, I have state's exhibits 23 through 31 are received into evidence without objection and may be published to the viewer. Thank you. Ms. Morley, placing on the viewer what's marked for identification states exhibit 23 now admitted. What are we looking at in states exhibit 23? That is the toilet seat in the bathroom. It has blood on it. And was there more than one bathroom? No, there was only one bathroom in the residence. Let's go to um, State's Exhibit 24, now admitted. And explain what we're seeing here. That is a close-up view of the blood on the toilet seat. And uh, did you find items um, that appeared to have some type of uh, substance or uh, wetness to them uh, as well? Yes, there was some pants and underwear in there that were saturated with blood. And um, let me go to um, let me go to State's Exhibit 26 and now I'll come back to 25 in a little bit. Uh, State's Exhibit 26 now admitted being placed on here. And, uh, what are we seeing uh, in this photograph? That is two towels that were located in the in front of the closet in the south West bedroom. And were the towels laid out flat in that condition the way they appear in this photograph? No, they were wadded up in a pile in front of the closet. Go to um, State's Exhibit 25, now admitted. And uh, is uh, this a closer view of one of those towels? Correct. And then State's Exhibit 27, now admitted. 
Uh, and is that a, a, a closer in range photo? Yes, that's a closer range uh, photograph of the items on the towel. And why were you? Why did you think it was important to take a closer in range photo of that? Um, the tissue and the blood that was on the the towel. I just wanted a better image of it. Now you mentioned clothes. Uh, where did you find clothes that had um, substance on them? There was a pair of pants and underwear in the bathroom, and then there was more in the laundry hamper in the in the southwest bedroom. So let me go to State's Exhibit 30. Now I know. And I believe, based on the flooring, I'm back in the bathroom, right? Correct. <laughs> in the bathroom. And so were these the items that you found on the bathroom floor? Yes. Do you recall what day or time of day you went to the residence on McKenzie? It was about 2.30 in the afternoon on the 8th. So the, the, you went the night of the 7th to rig outfitters? Correct. And the next afternoon? Correct. Um, were there other items um, in the bathroom other than um, clothing that you found of interest? Uh, the trash can was full of um, women's sanitary napkins. Uh, did you um, did you take the trash out to photograph it? Does that make sense? Yeah, Detective Perez took it out and, and laid it in the floor, and then I photographed it. Okay, all right. State's Exhibit 31. Now being placed on the glue. Uh, is this the items that had been in the trash can in that bathroom? Correct. Now, you said there were uh, there was other clothing. Um, was it in the bedroom that you had found that had yes. the substance? Okay. So um, I'm going to place on the viewer what's now admitted, State's Exhibit 28. And uh, are we back in the bedroom now? Yes. Okay. Based on the different floor. Uh, what did you tell us about what you were finding and what you did to take this photograph? Um, the gray t shirt. Yeah, black pants and um, underwear were found in a clothes, the dirty, the laundry pile that she had over there, um, next to her door. Um, I just laid them out so that I could photograph them, and then I did collect those items. And I'll go to State's Exhibit 29. Now I get it. And uh, is this a closer end of the, uh, what appears to be like a pair of pants, leggings, uh, and a pair of underwear? Yes, it is. Now, um, did you, um, then, uh, similar to uh, the trash bag you collected, um, did you collect, and the towel at the hospital, did you collect these clothing as well? Yes, I did. Uh, and uh, when you, uh, uh, did any of the items that you collected at the house have to similarly go in any type of dry locker or were they just locked in evidence? All the, all the blood and the blood clots and stuff needed to dry, so yes, they were hung in dry locker until they dried. And uh, after uh, all the different items were dried, that's when they then become like what's uh, the bag we see in front of us. It's some type of packaging then flying into evidence. That's correct. Uh, now, did you uh, uh, have uh, any further, other than you know, you're at the house, you haven't been in the house, did you have any other uh, items that were, uh, oh, it, can you tell the jury, I'm sorry, I asked which, there was more than one bathroom. Can you tell us what bedroom you were in that you found uh, the clothing in the towels? The what bedroom? The southwest bedroom. And it was right next to the bathroom. And did it uh, have any items that uh, 
any decor, anything in the room that gave him any indication of uh, the, the occupant who might reside in that room. It looked like a teenager's room. That where the clothes were, the school books, the high school stuff around. Now, um, after you had completed your work uh, at the residence, um, did any other uh, location or item become uh, assigned to you as part of the uh, investigation? We did a search warrant on the Jetta. Okay, a white Jetta. Jetta. Tell us about the white Jetta. Um, in the video, there was a white Jetta that had um, was used as the car, and um, we took it to the station and sealed it up with evidence tape so that we could do a search warrant on it to, to look at any any evidence that might be inside it. So let me take you back just a little bit. Um, when you were with uh, Mr. Embriali at Great Outfitters, uh, did you watch the video with him, or did you just say, okay, you're going to watch the video, here's a USB, I'll be back later? I watched the video. Uh, and so um, you uh, became aware that uh, there was uh, some type of white vehicle that would be of interest in the investigation? Yes. Uh, were you able, in what you could see in the video, to tell things like uh, what manufacturer, what type of vehicle, anything the identifier on the license plate? You could see the license plate. And from that, later, did you locate a vehicle uh, that uh, appeared to be the same uh, one from the video? Yes. Uh, and where did, you, where did you become aware that vehicle was? It was on the 800 block of McKenzie. And uh, where did your work become involved? Was it at that location with the vehicle, or how did that work? The vehicle was towed to the station and sealed with evidence tape and parked in the um, south parking lot. And then what? Just and walk then um, well, I photographed it before we broke the um, evidence tape sealed. And then I opened it and photographed the interior of the vehicle. Um, located any kind of documentation that was inside it and photographed the documents that I located inside it. And then we searched it for anything of evidentiary value. Now, you mentioned uh, evidence seals. So, kind of go back a little bit. The vehicle was located uh, at uh, basically the Avia residence. Is that, am I explaining that? Yes. You said it? Okay. So, it's going to be then taken back to the police department. Yes. Uh, when it's taken back to the police department, um, how how is it secured before it's moved? We place evidence tape over the doors, windows, um, any uh, the, if it has a hatchback or a trunk, the hood, sometimes a gas cap, and uh, those seals are not broken until we're ready to do the search warrant on it. And when you say we put the tape on, on this particular white Jetta. Were you involved in placing any of the tape? No, I was not. Uh, when you um, then come to work uh, with the vehicle at the Hospital Police Department, um, do you photograph these seals? Yes. And why do you do that? To prove that they're still intact and nobody's tampered with the evidence. And. Um, then after you photograph it um, with the seals, just walk us through the process of, of what you do from that. Well, we open the doors and um, photograph it before we move anything, and then we move stuff around a little bit to find stuff, and then we photograph more, whatever we need to. And then in, a, in addition to photographing and maybe collecting any items outside of this vehicle, was there any other work that, of investigation, that collection that you did uh, with this particular vehicle? No. Um, I have uh, what's already been admitted, um, State's Exhibits, uh, I'm sorry, State's Exhibit 9, placing on the board. Okay. All right, Ms. Morley, um, tell us what we're looking at today, Scott. We're looking at the Volkswagen Jetta that um, we did the search warrant on our side parking lot. 
are we able to see any of those uh, evidence seals uh, that you talked about uh, in this photograph? Yes, they're along each side of the hood, the little red tape. I'm going to go to Stacey's at a 10. Stacey's at a 10. Previously, I've been to Stacey's at a 10. Now, uh, tell us a uh, different angle. What can we see from this view? And you can see the parking permit and the went on the windshield, and then you see evidence tape on the driver door and the hood. And what was that parking permit that was on the window? That's for the Hobbs High School. Next, I'll go to um, what's marked for identification states exhibit 11, previously admitted. And we're just kind of going down the vehicle, so to speak, at this point. Uh, so what are we seeing uh, from this vantage? That's the driver's side. You can see evidence, excuse me, evidence tape on the driver door, the back door, the trunk, and there's a sticker on the rear windshield. You see part of the license plate. And we continue to see those pieces of red tape, those seals, uh, down the side in the trunk of the vehicle. Correct. Uh, I'm going to now move to State's Exhibit 14, previously And now, what are we looking at? That is a license plate on the, on the vehicle. <coughs> and then now go to uh, Smart for Identification, State's Exhibit 12. Admitted. And what are we looking at uh, in this photograph? That's the VIN number on the dash. Why do you photograph the VIN number out of the vehicle? Because it doesn't always match the license plate. And next, um, I'm going to go to uh, the Smart for Identification States Exhibit 13, now admitted. And what is depicted in this photograph? That is the uh, insurance for the vehicle with the name and all the information on the vehicle. And why would it be important uh, to, uh, since you located that in the vehicle, to, to take a photograph of it? What's the proof of ownership and documentation of the car? Now, uh, after you uh, had located um, the car uh, and been taken to the police department and you did your photographs on it, did you do any further work, uh, examination, inspection of that white Jetta? Um, um, we went through it. Um, we did locate an empty trash bag that was similar to type and texture, unused trash bag, and a back floorboard and then some documentation that had Ms. Abla's name on it and stuff. But I did not collect anything from inside the vehicle. Now you say a similar um, unused uh, trash bag, are you referring to the, the a black one, or I'll call it a black one, that's the, similar to the, the one that was the outer that we saw inside States 35? Correct, that is correct. Um, was there any type of um, item that could have secured the trash bag in anything that you found? I mean, trash bags sometimes are self, have their own self-closure where they'll have uh, either like a pull-out tie or maybe they have twist handles or maybe they come with the little twist ties. Did you find anything that could have uh, closed or kept the bag closed to what you found when you had the trash bag? I don't know, Jack, Jack, it's ask her to speculate. The uh, lead in asked for speculation, but the question at the end uh, was to, did she find anything to tie up a whole rule of the objection? Please restate the question. Let me start with, did the black bag that we were shown uh, to the jury, did it have any way to self-tie itself? Was it made with a built-in tie? No. 
Uh, did you find anything with the bag, inside of it, with it, that could have tied it? No. Uh, when you um, uh, finished with the car, uh, did you have uh, any other uh, uh, areas that you were assigned to then uh, next to go uh, and process? Yes, I went with Detective Perez to um, do another search warrant to collect a cell phone and the ring door cameras from the residence of 2800 Block of McKenzie. And um, did you um, uh, collect any such items? I collected um, Alexis Avila's cell phone and then the ring cam camera from your front door. And did you um, uh, do anything with uh, the cell phone? I did a cell phone extraction and put all the data onto a thumb drive and gave it to Detective Perez. And when you do uh, cell phone extraction, um, can you just kind of explain for the jury uh, what that means? Is there some manner in which uh, you just plug it in the computer? What do you do? How does that work? Um, we use a program called Oxygen Forensics and it actually makes a full copy of everything that is on the cell phone, including deleted messages and um, videos, and it makes a full copy and then we can um, view whatever we need to in it to find the information that we're looking for. Now, after you turned over that um, extraction to Detective Perez, was that cell phone placed into evidence? Yes. Uh, now, when you're uh, recovering, uh, if anything, from the, the ring doorbell system at the residence, uh, how are you recovering? How are you recovering something? I mean, how did that work? Do you take the device? How does it work? Um, I just take the device, and I'm not sure exactly what the detectives do to get the search warrant to get the information. Okay. So you physically collect the the doorbell ring doorbell to boss and you put in the evidence and then further work is done by a, a detective. Correct. After you collected the cell phone and that uh, doorbell camera, uh, what if anything else did you uh, do regarding this investigation? Don't know anything else. If I could have a moment. Okay, Your Honor, I will uh, pass the witness. Cross it down, yes, Is, uh, talk about um, you took a lot of photographs. We heard about that in direct exam, um, and you had recovered uh, some miscellaneous papers, I believe, according to your report, um, from some trash bags found in the car, or from the trash bag at the scene. The trash bag at the scene, yes. Right, and then you you also you talked a little bit about the, the Jetta and the search warrant. And I believe you said you didn't collect anything from it, but you did collect, um, and you mentioned it, I think, documentation from the glove box. I didn't collect it, I photographed it. Okay, you photographed it. Yes. Well, you had to take it out to photograph it. Correct. Yeah, so you collected it and you photographed it. Yeah, but I didn't keep it. Oh, you didn't keep it? No. Okay, you did photograph it. Yes. Okay. Um, Judge, if I'm going to uh, mark exhibits as defense, would it be A or 1? State's using numbers. You can use letters. All right. A.
Okay. All right. Uh, I understand uh, we need a bathroom break. Uh, during the break, don't discuss the case. Don't allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. Don't form any fixed opinions about the case. And the case is finally submitted to you. Please stand for the jury. too much, you know, like, I don't think it'd be that long. I don't think it, but, you know, I've said that before, Judge, and then all of a sudden... Well, we'll go, uh, if it goes on, on and on and on, we'll I take a lunch break. 
I don't think it will. I don't think it will. Yeah, we'll work around. Okay, then. Uh, court will be in recess uh, until all about uh, 20 till noon. 20 to noon. All right. Court's in recess.
be seated. Uh, Mr. Cowley, you yes. may proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Showing you what's uh, <coughs> what's been marked as a defense exhibit A, B, C, and D. I kind of put them in data working. Did you recognize those? So, so um, you, it's true, you retrieve those from either the vehicle or, or from the trash can or both? No. Just, that's just from the car? No. Where's it from? It's from the residence. It's on the bar in the kitchen. Okay, so you found those in where at? Do you remember? It's sitting on the bar in the kitchen at the residence on the kitchen. Okay, because in your, and I'm, I'm not complaining, it is what it is. I, based on your report, I, I thought one of those is or two of those came from the glove box in the car. No, they came from the glove box. They may have been in the car. The last one may have been in the car, but okay. Okay, and and um, you you do recall taking those? Yes, I do recall. And they're accurate representations of what you found and looked at. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to admit those, Judge and Devin. Any objection? Uh, no, the state's now being provided a copy of the exhibits that uh, the defense is going to All right. Uh, defense exhibits A, B, C, and D are admitted into evidence without objection and may be published. Thank you, sir. So that's, um, regardless of where it came from, you recovered it from either the house or the car, right? I photographed it, yes. Okay, well, okay, yeah, you're right, you, you photographed it. Um, so, so what we're looking at here looks like a, a visit to the Lee Ray Regional Medical Center by Miss Avia, the defendant in this case, right? Yes. And um, it looks like uh, she went in January 4th for, I don't know, it looks like back pain. Correct. And it looks like they gave her a prescription for like Tylenol and codeine and maybe something else, naproxen or something like that. Yeah, that's the end. And then B is, is uh, that looks like a little out of order, but that's that looks like a school release form on the same day, the 4th of January 2022 given to her by the Regional Medical Center, right? Correct. Saying that she could return to school the next day, um, no restrictions, um, she should be able to participate fully in school activities, etc. Right? Correct. And C is, uh, oh, let's see. It got cut off, I guess. So like you said earlier, you take you take close-ups, so I think some of these are just the same thing, closer up, is that right? Correct. This is different, but it's January 6th, and it's Hobbs Medical Same Day Clinic, so it looks like she may have visited there on the 6th. Correct. And um, then it says she can return to school. 
that's about it. Right? Yes. And then that's the same thing we just looked at, but maybe a little better picture of it. That, that's that a picture of the entire document instead of just the, the close up of the name. Okay. Good deal. Do I just give these to the court monitor? Yeah, yeah suppose. So I don't think I, I got much more, but I just, just want to make sure I'm the same. collecting the thumb drive from Mr. Imbrale from something outfitters. Great outfitters. There you go. So you're, you're the one that, you in fact gave him a thumb drive and said, hey, copy this video and then return it to me. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So earlier, um, you talked about watching, actually watching videos with him. Is that, did I catch that right? Yes. Okay. So wasn't that like eight hours worth of video? No. Well, I watched the incidents the, um, where the baby got thrown into the dumpster, and then the video where the three people found the baby in the dumpster. Right. And those were short parts. OK. We, we kept backing up and reviewing video until we found where, where the baby Where you need to be. Yes. OK. But it, it's true that, that he actually handed over like eight hours stuff. I don't have any idea exactly the amount of dollars. Okay, that's fair enough. I just wanted to clarify. Um, so, but you did give him a thumb drive and say, hey, you saw what you need to see, here's a thumb drive, you put it on there and get it to us. Correct. Right. And, um, and, you, and you caution them, hey, you know, don't release this stuff, right? This is evidence. But you put it on here and give it to us and that's it, right? I didn't tell him that, no. no. I think others did. Others did tell him that. Yes. Okay. Uh, have a moment, Judge. You may. That's all I got, Judge. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any redirect? Questions from the jury? Any objection to excusing Officer Morley? No objection. No objection, Judge. You're excused. Thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our lunch break at this time. During the break, once again, don't discuss the case. Don't allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. Don't do any research about the case. Don't form any fixed opinions about the case until the case is finally submitted to you. Uh, the next witness, uh, I'm told, will be here at 1.30. So I'm going to give you just a little bit longer time today. Uh, let's get back from lunch at 20 after 1, and then when everyone's in the jury room, uh, the witness ought to be ready to go and we can start without delay. Please stand for the jury.
after the meeting, maybe around 3.30. Uh, that that will be the, the witnesses, the others, uh, the other doctors are not available uh, until tomorrow. Okay. Um, and tomorrow that would leave um, Dr. Brennan, Dr. Bowen. And Dr. Bowen is not available tomorrow until the afternoon. So until the afternoon. And then Detective Perez. Right. Okay. Um, we'll try to schedule so that people aren't sitting around doing nothing. Um, anything from the defendant? No, Your Honor, I believe that that um, shuffling of the schedule will work out just fine with us also. We'll be ready tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, then, good deal. Um, I told the jury to be back about 20 after, so we'll be back about a quarter after, and we'll be ready to go. Court's at recess. Enjoy your lunch.
be seated. Ms. Sabatis, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Dr. Kumar. Transfer there for the more critical and more severe cases. Uh, 
more critical and more serious cases would come to you. Okay. Um, given your specialties, uh, I assume you've had to go undergo a significant training. Can you please explain to the jury kind of an overview of the training you've had? Sure. Um, so medical school, we did uh, medical school and that is for five years and then um, you have to do all licensing exam then you have to do pediatric residency that is three years so then you get pediatric board certified and then you have to do another three year um, that is called sub-specialization of fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine and then after that course certification another three years you can um, you are able to practice in neonatal medicine okay and um, in January of 2022, were you board certified at that time? Yes. And you had maintained all of the certifications required to be board certified? Yes. Um, how do you uh, generally keep up with current research in your field? So we have, um, we have weekly um, our uh, evidence based medicine, medicine practice. Then we have core meeting where um, we have at least uh, 17, 18 year old ICO physician and nurse practitioner. We meet virtually every month and we discuss about new evidence, any article we have to discuss on new protocol or any interesting case we discuss among ourselves. And uh, with different experience, they share the new evidence for that. So we try to do it. We also do our um, board certification has requirements. So every year we have to make sure we are um, doing with the CME and we are up to date with the board certification requirement. So we do all this. Okay. Um, and was that the practice back in January of 2022 as well? Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Kumar, what would you say uh, is the number of infant patients you have treated during your time at Covenants Hospital? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, what would you say is the general number of patients, uh, specifically infant patients, that you have treated during your time at Covenant Hospital? So, the Covenant Hospital lasts for five years, um, almost um, around uh, five to six hundred. Your Honor, at this time, the state would tender Dr. Kumar as an expert in neonatal medicine and pediatrics. Your Honor, may we approach on that matter? You might, if you wish to pour deer on that matter, you might. Uh, no, Your Honor, not necessarily pour All right.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, from time to time, as you've seen, it's necessary for the lawyers to confer at the bench. You should concern yourself uh, with uh, what's happening at the bench. Uh, you must not speculate about what we're talking about. Uh, it's uh, in an effort to try to make sure that all the evidentiary rulings are correct. You may proceed. Thank you, Honor. And um, just to clarify for the record, uh, the court has accepted Dr. Kumar as an expert. The court accepts Dr. Kumar as an expert in the field of pediatrics and neonatal medicine. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Kumar, did you receive a patient into your care at Covenants Hospital um, in January of 2022 from Hobbs, New Mexico? Yes. Okay. Um, what was the purpose or your involvement with treating that patient? So, um, I started, I think, uh, second, uh, the third day of care, and that is our routine um, rotation. So our we are four there, and we rotate every week, like one week. So um, when I started, that is my turn. So I received, and that was at that time it was continuation of the care. So I just um, uh, got the sign out, and just I continue to maintain a continuation of care for that patient. Okay. Um, so if I'm clear, this patient had been treated at your facility, and you uh, provided ongoing care. Yes, ongoing. So it admitted, and then my colleague admitted the patient is supplied at that time, whatever needed, and then I, I went ahead and wrote for the ongoing care. Okay. Um, so what was known to you about this patient when it came into your care? So the, I again when we receive any patient, new patient there, um, we went to the you know all the uh, history background and what I got in the sign out that um, baby was born in a house and um, we don't know exactly time of birth. They are they were like um, expecting around 13. Uh, that was January 7th, I believe, um, around roughly around 1:30. But around six hour later, actually they got. Um, attention and the EMS came and that baby went to the house ER for more hypothermia at that time baby had low heart rate and very low temperature I believe it was 27 degrees centigrade when baby went to Hobbs ER. In the Hobbs ER got stabilized the baby, got a stabilization there and temperature came up after intense warming. Um, they also um, gave a uh, saline bolus and warming. The heart rate came after the temperature stabilization. And then further, this baby needed further care, so we went for the for the admission for the government children's NICU. Baby has to go to the ER first to get the evaluation and further, so they can get admitted in the uh, NICU. So you cannot admit from outside directly to NICU. So we went to the government's ER where got more further history, the stabilization, and after that they consult us, and then we got admitted to neonatal ICU. Okay, so just to be clear, um, the trajectory was the ER in Hobbs and then the ER at Covenant's Perfect. Children's yeah. and then um, into your unit at the NICU. Yes. Okay, and you mentioned hypothermia, low temp, and heart concerns when the baby was initially received into the first ER. Unit. That was the main immediate concern was that. Okay. Um, so I want to go through each of those in turn. Um, what, if anything, were you addressing during your care regarding hypothermia? So in my care, at that time, uh, it was at this area, the third day I started care, and I took care of four days till discharge. And at that time, um, even baby got admitted, my colleague admitted at that time, um, baby temperature was stable. Uh, uh, admit temperature, when my colleague admitted, uh, temperature was 36 and 0.7 degrees centigrade, so at Celsius. So at that time, temperature was normal at that time. And uh, when I was taking care at that time, all the vitals are normal. And we be working on the PO bottle, uh, bottle of the scales. And also, the tone was also a little concerned, low tone. And so, tone also was improving when I started my care. And other concern we had at a time where the renal function was poor. Uh, so um, my care, it was also improving. So when we discharged, all vitals were normal. And baby was taking everything by bottle. And um, creatinine also, kidney function also normalized. 
So we maybe made all the parameters, and then at the time we discharge the baby for the operation follow-up with the pediatrician. Okay. Um, and for us in the courtroom and the jury um, who don't handle this every day, I'm going to ask you more specific questions about each of these. So regarding that you mentioned low tone, let's start there. What is low tone? So usually um, all the babies, and this is more uh, in-depth we go, um, even looking at the tone, you can tell so many things if the baby is sick. So if the baby is very sick, their tone is very, they don't have any tone. So they are floppy, they have hypotonia, so it's called hypotonia with low tone. So um, initially, that was not in my care concern, but initially when I got signed out, initially baby has no poor tone, means like they are more floppy floppy uh, baby. Um, so all the muscles and everything was very relaxed and posture also very, yes, like, um, very floppy posture. But, and that is we call it. So when lift up the baby, their neck is like the tooth goes back, so you don't have any support in the neck also. That is called central tone, very feral, like, you know, your hand is straight, your neck will be straight. But in normal tone, maybe usually they have little bit tone, so they are more like a uh, little bit uh, flex, flex is like this. So in a normal birth or normal circumstance, um, a baby would have average tone as well? Yeah, as normal tone, normal. that's a little bit flex, leg, flex, arms. And if you lift up the baby with the hand, the neck will go lag. So the neck also comes, not very fast, but there's no lag on the neck and the neck and the head. Okay. And in this case, however, the child is exhibiting low tone, low tone initially low tone. on. Yeah, initially. And um, why is that of a concern? For example, of a uh, specialist such as yourself, why would low tone be concerning? So low tone, there's just so many possibilities. One is that the tone is uh, controlled by the brain. So brain controls the tone of the muscles and brain and spine actually. So if you see low tone, that is a differential, when we say differential, like what is the thought comes one to three. One is that low tone comes like, you know, maybe something brain is not functioning properly. Second thing, maybe baby is very sick and the baby is septic means they had infection or something like that. So usually two things comes in our mind once you see the tone. Okay. Um, did you have any reason to understand what may have contributed to the low tone in this particular case with this infant? In this case, um, poor tone that could be because it happens. Um, we don't know what circumstance, circumstances what happened, but when the because after just after birth you have to take care of because this is the transition time. Baby is under mom's womb, and baby, once the baby born, we have to make sure baby transition very well. So make sure we put at that time oxygen saturation. Make sure brain oxygen is good. Baby has no respiratory distress. Make sure temperature is maintained. So transition is real smooth. At this point, we don't know. We can say a couple of things that we possibly first thing that we don't know how the oxygen saturation was there at that time. The baby is very cardiac, means the heart rate was low, so maybe the heart was not functioning properly. And one of the main functions of the heart is the, to bring the oxygen to the different organ level. And first priority is usually the body gives the oxygen to go to the brain. So it could be at that time the transition didn't go well because it was not the ideal. Uh, circumstances. So it could be something like you know, one is called hypoxic injuries of the brain or hypoxia is called just the general hypoxia where it might be um, brain didn't get enough oxygen so it was maybe at that phase where brain is struggling um, to get more oxygen and um, that could be one of the region in this case, case uh, we can think about maybe um, it affected the child. And as an expert, if a newborn had been placed in a bag that was sealed, could that have impacted the oxygen levels? Yeah, it could be. And that could be a contributing factor to low tone? That could be. A okay. Low oxygen, and even the temperature, because once the temperature goes down, your heart rate uh, follows the temperature, so the heart rate will go down. And again, if the heart is not pumping enough oxygen, you will have less oxygen. How do you treat an infant who is exhibiting signs of low tone? So first, uh, first normal thing we try to bring all the parameter normal, like you know, make sure the heart rate is normal. This baby also has low um, hematocrit. I think bleeding happens. Uh, 
Uh, it could be because of that uh, when the baby is born, you have to tie the umbilical cord so blood does not go from the babies to outside. So it might happen the blood loss from there. So the function, there are a couple of things that contribute to oxygenation of the different organ. One is the hematocrit, that the red blood cell. The function of the red blood cell to carry the oxygen to different organs. So if you have overall low hematocrit, that means the red blood cells is low, that impair the oxygenation of the different organs. Second could be, as you say, the back was tight, so enough, not getting enough. That is called asphyxia. You do are not getting enough oxygen, so that could be the second thing. Third thing will be um, the low heart rate. So once the baby comes, we receive that. First try to uh, tackle all this common thing. Make sure all the vitals, babies warm up, all the vitals are normal, or the hematocrit is normal, everything is stabilized, and then it still has poor tone. Then we go to further testing, and that could be um, doing the MRI and looking for more detail, like why this baby has poor tone. Some baby born with a poor tone, that could be because I told some malformation or something you have in the brain. So we go step by step. Once you do all your vitals and normal process, everything normalized, still we have this with the tone, then you do the second step like looking on the MRI. And after that, then you do the genetic work and that will be the same. Okay. Um, and the vitals were checked in this case? So, um, yeah, so at that time, the first time, definitely these are very obvious cause of the low tone. So once we um, stabilize these vitals, then improved, that thing improved. And with that time, every, every day we saw that it takes time to recover. So uh, every day we looked at and saw the tone was improving. Um, and you mentioned that you have stabilized and then you mentioned that it takes time to recover. Um, so each day was improving. If these vitals had not been stabilized, what would have been the outcome? If the vitals, what we saw in initial process, maybe the half then maybe would not. Alright, the next thing you mentioned, Dr. Kumar, was renal, uh, renal, fu renal function, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, that it was poor but improving. Can you explain more about what you observed regarding that in this patient? So, a renal function, one of the markers for the kidney function is um, creatinine, and that was elevated. Um, there's just so many uh, cause for that one. One is that when the baby is born, sometimes we see it, the creatinine level, initial 24 hour that reflects mom's creatinine. So if you have mom admitted, you can see mom's is, you know, some kidney failure or some high kidney, um, high kidney. Then you can correlate with that and then say, oh, okay, let's watch and see in a couple of days how it goes. Um, second cause is, again, like, you know, hypoxia is a main contributor could be. Because hypoxia, if, uh, if the injury happened because of the low oxygen, and then affect any organs, and that could be the liver, kidney, brain, heart, and when we, in this kind of circumstances, we always check these vitals on We check the liver function test. In this case, the liver function was also impaired. And then kidney function, chest, and, and sometimes we also check the troponin in the heart function also. Um, so um, we know that if you have hypoxia, means low oxygen to all these vital organ, they, they don't sustain, they don't sustain long time. So that's why we wanted to check all this function. And these are, we can, you can think about these are my differential, now these are, could be the top, you can think about the diagnosis. And it could be, um, it could be any of these, like, but most likely it could be hypoxia. But as you know, we don't have mom's labs and mom's um, history, so I cannot correlate, like, you know, if the mom's getting it high, we can think about that, so the baby's also high. But in this situation, it looks like it could be some, um, some damage because of the oxygen was low. Okay, so if you had on mom's labs, you could have checked um, for the kidney failure that you were discussing. Discussing. So that could be, if everything is fine, then definitely mom's lab is high, then so this is because of the spots. But if you have this kind of setup, it's always, um, it, it is uh, obvious to see it might have some damage. And in your opinion, you believed it was possibly because of low oxygen in this case? Yeah, I don't have MOMS lab, so it could be, yeah, that is one of the differential diagnoses. And during your time in treating this patient, did that improve? Yes, that improved. And, and why was that? What care did you administer to see that improvement? 
So uh, we didn't do, again, the vital stems uh, uh, normalized, and then all these organs have some, uh, it's, it's called plasticity, so they try to heal, they try to get better, but they're just giving time. So once, like, you know, your uh, hematocrit gets better, one oxygenation is better, one perfusion is better, then all these organs try to uh, heal and try to get better. Unless sometimes you uh, hit that point where there's no recovery, then you need all the renal transplant and all this renal dialysis and everything. But at earlier stage, you stabilize, you make sure uh, there's different types of renal failure. One is called prenatal, when the, there's not enough fluid in the baby. So this baby also got because of the it's called, in medical term, it's called hypovolemia, means we have no overall fluid in the body. So this baby might have not taken a feeding for seven, eight hours or 10 hours, we don't know. So at that time, the you know, blood sugar might have down, the overall fuel level is down. And that is one of the contributor for that kidney damage too. So once we see like an RPA stage, we intervene, and most likely if you are not in that end point, then it, they recover slowly, and that's why in this case, I believe it happened. Okay, um, were you administering fluids to this infant? No, I have not. Just one selling bolus, I think, got it, and that got on the, the what I know and how Okay. Um, were you administering oxygen or doing anything to monitor the oxygen levels? Yes. Um, all the baby, when they get admitted in the ICU, they all, we always put the baby on the monitor, cardiac monitor. So we were monitoring oxygen level, and I, um, baby in first day, 24 hour, baby was on oxygen, some oxygen support. Was on support in the first 24 hours at Covenant? Covenant. Okay. Covenant. All right. Uh, the next thing you mentioned, Dr. Kumar, was um, the kidney function and creatine, which I believe we've covered. Is that correct? Um, and I, just for clarification, what is creatine? Cre I'm not saying it correctly. Yeah. Creatine. Yeah. So creatinine is actually um, the metabolized product of the protein. So kidney function, the kidney has function that they filter all these things. Like you know, all the like all our muscles and everything, one is called creatinine phosphokinase. So they usually go the muscle, the most all the muscle they take the one is called ATP. I don't know if you know um adenine triphosphate. ATP is the energy molecule. When we eat whatever it just stores in the ATP. And then the muscle utilizes that one, so they uh, release the muscle, release the creatinine. And creatinine, what happens? It doesn't filter muscle. So the exactly you look at the kidney function in any adult and pediatric population, you need to see the creatinine. How much creatinine you see in the urine? Usually, it's supposed to be very less. If it's like that again, it goes with the, the age of the person. In pediatric world, we see 0 0.5, 0 0.6 in the urinal world. But if it goes to 0 0.8, 1, 1.5, that actually has the high, high marker. So that means that the kidney is not functioning properly to retain this one, and that's why you see the urine is going up. So that's why the creatinine function in, one of, um, in the blood we look for like the high creatinine, that is a very important marker for the kidney function. And you mentioned 0.5 or 0.6 is normal, did you say in adults? In adults, uh, I don't remember, but pediatrics and neonatal world, we see the 0.6, 0.5 is normal, but it also goes with the you know, age. If some person is athletic, maybe the creatinine, their threshold is high, but it goes with the age, and at this age, if you, we see that it goes trending up like more than one, we see it always is high. And this baby had, I think, 1.6, I believe, but I have to double check, but I think it's 1.6. Is there anything that would help um, you recall that exact level? Um, I think in the discharge summary, we have it. Okay. Or admission summary. The discharge paper? The discharge paper. Okay. Uh, may I have a moment, Your
And then I believe you also mentioned, Dr. Kumar, that this baby um, presented as septic. What does that mean? Um, sorry, I was not clear. So a baby didn't present as septic, but I say that if you have poor tone, these are the differential diagnosis you have. So if some baby is poor tone, we looked at maybe baby is very sick and septic, or baby has some hypoxic damage, um, or any brain problem would have played to that. But uh, this baby, um, even baby was on ampicillin and then the antibiotics, but it didn't have any blood culture positive for the infection or anything like that. Okay, so you didn't diagnose any infection? And no infection, yeah. okay. But baby was uh, for 48 hour ampicillin and gentamicin. So anytime you see the high risk if the baby was you know, not born born in a septic precaution and baby had this kind of history, then we always try to uh, prophylactically Empirically, we try to rule out sepsis, and in that case, we send the blood culture and then start antibiotics. In 48 hours, if the blood culture is negative, means no growth of any bacteria, we stop antibiotic at that time. And in this case, we didn't have any culture positives, so baby was not septic. Okay, but you did administer, or the doctors in the yes. school care did administer antibiotics. Antibiotic for 48 hours. Okay, to ensure that there was. Um, not an infection. Not, yeah, it's called rule out sepsis. Okay. Are you aware if this um, patient had a blood transfusion? Yes. Um, tell us about that. So, um, the baby has initial hematocrit, um, I believe it's 26, and after transfusion, the hematocrit went up to 39, so baby got um, a blood transfusion in this case. And I'm sorry, Dr. Kumar, I didn't understand what you said right before you said it was at 26 and up to 39. So um, the different level, one is called hemoglobin level. Um, so hemoglobin level and the same thing can reflect is called hematocrit level. So most of our, our studies in based on the hematocrit. So hematocrit is also like, you know, if you see, if you put the, in the test tube, you put the blood and the sediment, the red blood cell sediment, and depending on the, this is the blood and red blood cells actually segment there and they measure that, like how much red blood cells the baby has it. And they have normal parameters. So normally usually we see in the baby is around 45 to uh, 65 in the normal range. And if the less than 45, then we say it's low. Um, sometimes we also define as anemia. And so in this case, um, I think I believe we are 26 was the amount of weight. So the blood transfusion occurred to increase that blood cell count. Yes, so I'd say the blood function of the blood cells is, uh, for blood overall is to maintain the blood pressure, maintain the perfusion of the vital organ, and the oxygen carrying capacity, because red blood cells actually force the oxygen in the you know, lungs and bring it through the blood to the different organs. Okay, and um, you said it improved from a 26 to a 39. At what point was the infant at 39? After transfusion. After, okay. 26 and was prior transfusion, and after immediate transfusion, it improved to 39. And if I heard you correctly, 45 is normal, so normal. You, even after the transfusion, this infant still is not at a normal level. Normal. Yes, so um, we see this is, um, this is actually um, more like, you know, ideal, you want it to be 45, but uh, again, like, you know, when to transfuse 39 is fine, so we accept 39. But if the baby is very, very sick, suppose not in this case, in general, if the baby gets some time, is very sick on ventilator, or suppose 100%, 80% oxygen, at that time, you try to optimize. So in that time, maybe we should have given another transfusion. So just in general, um, but in this baby, at that time, baby was not on too much oxygen, or baby is room air, so we accepted 39 is fine. Baby will be, it won't impair any um, organ function or any functional recovery, so we accept. Okay, um, but without that transfusion, transfusion would um, the organs in this infant have been impacted? Yes. How so? Um, so the body try to compensate some time, but uh, usually uh, we come up with a look at all this protocol and our policy also have, if you have that low, and if the baby was initially, I think it one liter or something oxygen. So to optimize the hypovolemic shock, um, make sure baby blood pressure is maintaining 
and oxygen carry capacity would be maintaining, so that's why you actually be given a transfusion. And similar to uh, the kidney failure, if this had not been administered, would there be other organ failure, potentially? Um, yes. And could that also result in death? Yes, at that point of stage, if you keep going on, we have to. Then again, like the, the main function of this one, as I said, oxygen carrying capacity. So you might have maybe needed more oxygen uh, support, maybe ventilator support. So at that time, when we start going more down and down, then you will have hypovolemia, means your blood pressure is started not feeling your blood pressure. And the function of the blood pressure to push the blood to the different organs. So if the blood pressure goes down, then different vital organs is not getting enough um, blood, you know, oxygen, so this system might happen. Maybe you must do that. expect to the time. 
um, so um, depending on how premature your baby born. And again, if the term baby comes, then depending on the how, what is the problem the baby has, then it varies with the innovation of the um, And in this case, the patient was a term baby. Yes. So I'm assuming you did not need prolonged care because it was not more premature, as you just uh, yes. stated. Yes. Okay. Um, and then that's why you made the recommendation for pediatric follow-up. How many days did this patient spend in the NICU at Covenant Children's? So, um, Covenant baby admitted on 8th of January and discharged on 13th. Okay. And we were six days. And at what point did you take over the care? You know, so, I took care of the baby last four days. Okay. regarding the transition um, and the maintaining proper vitals, did you have any other ongoing concerns um, for the future care of this patient upon discharge?
What about babies who are born in ideal conditions in the hospital? Could they also get sick and die within those first 28 days of life? I mean, term may be very less likely if you are born in the hospital. Okay, so less likely if the baby is born in the hospital. Um, if they're born in, in you said, non-antiseptic conditions, is that what you said earlier? Yeah, aseptic. Yeah, non-aseptic. Non-aseptic, okay. So babies who are born in certain conditions are more likely to die than others. Okay, and so a baby who was born at home without medical interference, more likely than others? More likely than the, when the mom is admitted in the like, on level 4 DQ or tertiary care, then definitely risk is there more. Okay. Okay, let's talk about babies with, with kidney problems. Um, high creatinine levels in a baby, what, what will cause that? Um, so that was explaining. So um, that's what these when the baby born. These are the common issue we see that commonly. Uh, so we see in the medical terms called differential diagnosis. So anything we have, we do one, two, three, what we you know, and then we short it out. So um, I was saying that uh, one thing: if the mom has high creatinine level, and through the transplant, and through the placenta, it goes to the baby. And if the baby is also high creatinine level, then we have no other factor, then we can think about, you know, maybe it happened because mom's at height, it crosses the placenta. Now we see the baby. In that situation also, after a couple of days, the creatinine will go down, and baby's peeing well, and everything is fine, so you don't have to worry about it. Other situation, then uh, anything we come up with is called differential diagnosis, like, like one to three. Because we need sort of way to work it out. We cannot do like a scan the kidney and do like you know BCOG, do different kind of scan. We have to sort it out. So once we that is the history house, right? So once we see that kind of history, then we focus that approach. Oh, that, that is the history suggesting could be that is the leading that path. So that's why uh, if the mom is not there, if we don't know the moms and we see this kind of history, then we get a chance of that could be you know, hypoxic damage happens, so that's why we focus more toward that pathway. Okay, so um, high creatinine levels, you know, in the mom that passes to the baby, uh, uh, actually in the baby, um, what other causes could vary for that? Now, high creatinine, maybe mom has some kid um, the kidney issues, like, you know, kidney failure or something, and she has high contribute to high creatinine? It could be, but uh, the most important thing we have to check the mom's creatinine. Okay. If the uh, mom's creatinine is normal, then we don't have to go further, like mom has disease or not. So it's important to see the mom's creatinine prior to birth. Okay, now in this case, where you couldn't see the mom's creatinine, were there other things that you had to eliminate as far as the reason for these high levels? Uh, yes, so um, the high level and the setup was more. Um, you know, inclining towards, you know, hypoxic injury because that was the proper setup was there. So that's why, you know, we didn't see the, all the moms and everything else because it's a proper setup. And this setup is very textbook. Like, you know, if you see that dyspraxia is one you know, medical trauma diagnosis called HIE, hypoxic ischemic injury. And this is very uh, textbook. Once we have something like that suspected, you have to see the end organ damage, and we have like protocol. Once we see something, it triggers that. Do this, this uh, vitals um, uh, or vital organs function, and so because of the setup, we thought like you know, it could lead to the creatinine of okay. But in medical, um, again, like you know, we see that you know, one point six, and we saw the setup, and then next day it just started after hydration, everything it started going down. So we thought, okay, we are in the right path. Okay. Uh, and, and speaking of, you know, renal failure, kidney issues, could they lead to death in an adult as well? Yes. So in any age group, kidney failure could? Yes. Okay. Now, in this case, the baby did not die, correct? Yes. Not, certainly not in your care. You discharged the baby. And you discharged the baby because you saw improvement. And uh, by the time you discharge the baby, you did not discharge the baby to any other specialty. 
your name is Dr. Baby Too Old, kidney doctor or a heart doctor. Yeah, no bell sign. No brain doctor. Just a regular pediatrician. And um, is that normal that a baby be referred to have a pediatrician? So a pediatrician, so um, pediatrician also goes to all drivers training and they know uh, all this thing, like you know, when to get help. So pediatric office, when we don't have any concern, they even, they might not be able to take care of that issues, but they can pinpoint, they can find out, like, you know, this is the problem I have. And they have referral, they have all the offices, so they can refer from there when they have concern. So when we discharge at the time, we saw all the vitals are in each mind, so there's no way you're sending to the CCR. So if you saw that something else was wrong with the baby, you would have sent the baby to a specialty. Yes. Time. At the time of discharge. Yeah. Um, you were talking earlier about transition, right? Transition from womb to life for a baby. So babies don't just get born and know how to do life. Do they always necessarily know how to breathe properly on their own? Not always. Sometimes they need, maybe sometimes they have meconium there. Sometimes uh, the obstructive so you have to make sure starts so until your nose mouth, and sometimes they need some, you know, depending on the house. So that's why when the baby is born, we dry suction and stimulate and make sure they transition as smooth so they can fly, they can go further. So yeah, sometimes even charm baby could have difficulty. So they could have difficulty breathing. Breathing, yes. They could have difficulty feeding. Okay. Without medical intervention. Um, are there other difficulties that full-term babies born in ideal conditions could have without help and support? Um, I would say no, depending on either, sometimes they have you know, cardiac issues, congenital malformation, anything that you can suspect. But most of the full-term, all the organs are okay. They just have initial transition, like just the suction, stimulation, drying, and uh, make sure baby is you know, feeding and blood sugar is fine. So this is the main thing we do in the trauma. 99%. Okay. Um, and one of the things newborns may have trouble doing is regulating their body temperature, correct? Now, um, have you seen this baby since his discharge from your hospital? Um, but at the time that you let the baby go, he was all clear and just had to see a baby. And they have all the contact and everything. Anytime we addition need any information or any concern, they usually call us. Okay. If I may, I just move. You may. I have no further questions. Thank you, Dr. Any Any redirect? Because when they suck, 
and then pause the breathing because here both are the common passes for the air and the fumes here. Um, so when they swallow, at that time they have to pause the breathing and otherwise they can aspirate. So that's why we watch all this time and make sure bottle is working. So we see like a full feed is suppose like baby has 100 ml and baby tip like one is 60 ml. Then 40 ml we feed the baby through the Uzi tube. So we put the tube down to the nose or to the mouth to the, the stomach and we push that uh, other extra feed with baby to finish that through that tube. So once we, in a couple of days, we make sure the baby is taking everything by mouth. There is no feed goes to the Uzi tube because at home you don't have that access. And once at least 24 hours to 48 hours, if the baby shows that baby is taking everything by mouth, then it says, okay, it's ready to go. And you know, all other things like temperature and everything. So we have to monitor, we make sure baby is taking everything by mouth. So upon the time of discharge, following your care, core tone had been addressed. The uh, high creatine levels had been addressed. The hypoxia was no longer uh, a dire concern. And the baby had not been uh, deemed positive for septic or an infection. And that was following eight days of care at Covenant Children's. Yes, um, it is eight or six days. Six days, I apologize, I did math. Um, the 8th through the 13th, so six days. Um, may I have a moment, Your Yes. Uh, this witness may be excused. Did you have anything further? Nothing further. Any questions from the jury of Dr. Kumar? Any objection to excusing Dr. Kumar? No objection. You're excused, sir. Thank you. What are your next witness? Your Honor, the state calls uh, Dr. Shaver Lee now. I want to the end if you want to stand and stretch your legs while we're waiting. Please feel free to do so. Children and Families at Brady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Uh, let's start first with your work as an associate professor. Uh, what are the fields in which you teach at the, uh, the school out there? So I teach in the Department of Pediatrics in the Division of Child Abuse Pediatrics. With regards to your work as the medical director of the facility that you mentioned, uh, what are your roles and responsibilities uh, in that position? So I'm a child abuse pediatrician. In my clinical part of that role, I evaluate children who are suspected victims of child maltreatment. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, sexual assault, neglect, drug endangerment, all of those types of things. As the medical director of the clinic at the Children's Advocacy Center, my job is to ensure that all of the physicians are maintaining their board certification that everybody's adhering to standards of care and that our patients and families are receiving the services that they need. 
Doctor, what brought you to uh, these positions? Uh, what, what drove you to pick this field of medicine? Good question. Um, it chose me more than I chose it, I think. Um, I was a neonatal intensive care nurse previously in my life, so I have always been drawn to pediatric patients. When I went to medical school, I had a desire to learn about um, pathophysiology, meaning what is the underlying cause of disease or disease processes. So I thought I was going to do pathology. I ended up deciding not to do that um, for personality reasons, and I opted to do pediatrics. I had a bunch of patients who were victims of child abuse, and um, one in particular who had really severe injuries that the Child Protective Services, where I trained, didn't understand. And so I was talking to the social worker, hey, I can't in good conscience discharge this patient if they don't understand the severity of his injuries and the risk that he is going to have if he goes home. So she told me to get the child abuse pediatrician involved, and I was like, the who? And I learned about the position, I was like, that is a really cool thing. I can advocate for children and families to be safer and healthier, and it's also kind of like a solve the puzzle kind of deal, which brings together my passions of pediatrics and pathophysiology. So we talked a little bit about sort of the, the point in your career that you're at right now. Uh, the work that you do in these two capacities, what drew you to this profession. Uh, my question for you is what sort of education did it take to uh, get to this point in your career? Very expensive education. Um, so I received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Rochester, that's in Rochester, New York. That was in 2000. Subsequently, I worked as a neonatal intensive care nurse for four years. In that time, I received a graduate certificate in anatomy from the Medical College of Virginia, which is part of Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I received that degree in 2004. Also in 2004, I entered medical school at the Medical College of Virginia. I graduated there in 2008. In 2008, I began a pediatric residency program which I attended at Virginia Commonwealth University Health Systems. I graduated that in 2011. In October of 2011, I was board certified in general pediatrics. Also in 2011, I moved to San Antonio, Texas, where I began a fellowship training program, which is a, an additional three-year program in the subspecialty of child abuse pediatrics. I was at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Also in 2011, I began work as a general pediatrician at an outpatient office in San Antonio, Texas called Aguirre Pediatrics. I graduated my fellowship program in 2014, at which point I moved to Albuquerque, and I was an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of New Mexico there. I also was a child abuse pediatrician that worked with the child abuse response team at the University of New Mexico, also called the CART team. I became the medical director of Para Los Niños, which is an outpatient sexual abuse assessment center in Albuquerque in 2015. In 2015, I was board certified in child abuse pediatrics. And then in 2018, I moved from the University of New Mexico to the University of California at San Diego. So you mentioned a couple terms there, and I just want to make sure that we uh, sort of set out which domains you've become both board certified in and that you've had experience in. Uh, so starting first with the field of general pediatrics, um, my question for you is, uh, are there different specialties in medicine? Yes, there are. Uh, how are those specialties in medicine sort of self-regulating, or how do they ensure that someone, in fact, is a specialist within that field in medicine? So there's a couple of different ways that you become specialized in medicine. So you attend a ACGME, which is the American College of Graduate Medical Education, 
accredited training program. In my case, it was in pediatrics. You can do this in any sort of specialty. The ones that do primary care are pediatrics, internal medicine, and family medicine. Then the American Board of whatever specialty you choose, in my case, pediatrics, regulates um, the board certification process, which means that I had to graduate from an accredited medical training residency in good standing, and then I had to pay a bunch of money and take a test. I have to, I had to pass that test, and then I have to maintain my certification, which means that I have to prove to the board that I am continuing to have ongoing education. That works in a couple of different ways. I have to um, do different parts of proving that. Some is taking um, test questions every quarter so that I have to prove that I still have the knowledge to be board certified. I also have to do quality improvement initiatives and I have to engage in maintaining the forward trajectory of medicine. So constant improvement and constant learning. Then the subspecialties, you have to finish all of those things I previously talked about, then do additional training in your subspecialty. For pediatrics, that's an additional three years. Pay another bunch of money, pass the test, and then again, maintain board certification in your subspecialty. Uh, so starting first with the specialty uh, with regards to pediatrics, could you define for the jury what pediatrics is? What, what is that field? Pediatrics is the medicine involved in taking care of children. So by definition, we consider children age 0 to 18 from a legal standpoint, um, but we take care of children up until about the age of 24. You mentioned a test that is administered. Uh, who would, like, what is this board composed of? Is it other pediatricians? So, yes, so it's other specialists in the field that have to ensure that there are um, questions, testing questions that are applicable to all of the specialty of pediatrics, so regardless of subspecialty, and that they um, are age appropriate, so not just age appropriate for pediatrics, but also with regard to what is happening with science and medicine right now. So they constantly get updated as science improves, and then those questions get administered to the rest of the specialty of pediatrics, and that ensures that you are keeping up with your specialty. When we're talking about the evolution of any field of medicine, would it be fair to say that today medicine is in a better place for patients versus 700 years ago? 100%. And that it's changing over time? It always changes over time. As our knowledge of science and the body process improves, so does medicine. And let's talk about the subspecialty of child abuse pediatrics. What does that mean? That means that not only am I um, a general pediatrician, but I also have a specialty in it, in helping other professionals determine whether or not any particular signs or symptoms for a child are related to abuse or neglect specifically. So in the same way if you go to your doctor with chest pain, they may think, hey, I think this is a problem with their heart and send you to a cardiologist where the cardiologist will determine, yes, this is a heart problem or no, not me, that heart problem and send you back to your general practitioner. I help other professionals determine whether any particular child has been subject to abuse or neglect. Uh, when you're doing this, uh, this process of differentiation, is there a term uh, for the process of you uh, locating a cause of injuries that children sustain? So in any medical evaluation, you have to gather information in multiple different domains. So you have to understand what brought this person to me right now. We call it the history of presenting illness. So why are you here to see me? What are the injuries or um, findings that are pertinent to this evaluation? 
then I have to look at past medical history. Is there something with your underlying health that may be playing a role in the signs and symptoms that I'm seeing today? I also have to understand your family medical history to determine is there some sort of genetic process that may be playing a role. In pediatrics, we also take a, what we call a social history. So that is um, in order to determine whether or not a child's living environment is playing a role. For example, if I have a child who's underweight, is that because this family doesn't have access to food? Do they have um, insecure transportation? So things that I can help the trajectory of this family to improve the health of the child. Then sometimes there are laboratory tests that we obtain to help us determine what's happening and imaging tests. At the end of that, we create what we call a differential diagnosis. So I have a list of things that could lead to the findings that I'm seeing, and we basically check them off one at a time. So with our tests, like our laboratory tests and our imaging tests and the history provided, I can remove things from my differential diagnosis. Like this could not be the cause. And at the end, we come up with a um, diagnosis that is a working diagnosis, meaning what I have determined to be the cause of this child's symptoms, if that makes sense. So doctor, we've talked a little bit about the field, about your educational background, and about your, uh, your current work that you're doing. Uh, we've also discussed a little bit about the evolution of these fields over time. Uh, how is it that information is disseminated uh, in the field of child abuse, PGA, pediatrics, or any subspecialty of medicine? Uh, what is it that, that, that doctors do when they uh, disseminate information? What's that process called? There's a couple of ways information gets disseminated. A lot of it is based on scientific or clinical research. So we ask the clinical question, we research it amongst our patients, and then we come up with an answer. So scientific inquiry is what moves medicine forward as a practice. And so a lot of our new learning is based on new science, so research that comes out. That research is disseminated not only publicly, so in publications where I can look at them through PubMed or Google Scholar, but there are also medical societies that physicians belong to that help to narrow down your focus of like information attainment. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is a large professional society for pediatricians uh, across the country. Um, I belong to that association, and so information is disseminated by the American Academy of Pediatrics. I also belong to a professional society called the Helfer Society. That's an international society of child abuse physicians where we do research specific to child abuse and neglect issues, and there are meetings and a listserv to help disseminate information in my field of um, medicine specifically. Uh, when you're mentioning these other uh, societies and uh, uh, groups that are involved in the publication of scientific research, uh, does the term peer review uh, mean anything in that process? So peer review is a part of the process of publication in which editors of journals will ensure that when somebody submits an article for publication, they send it to other professionals in that field to look at that research to ensure that research is done appropriately, that what they are studying, their conclusion is accurate to what they're studying, and that all of the math that goes into making a conclusion is correct. And have you yourself been published? I have, yes. Approximately how many times? Well, gracious. Um, I believe I have five journal publications that have been published in books. I also have an online publication with the American Academy of Pediatrics that's called a Visual Diagnosis CD. It's not actually a CD, it's a jump drive. Um, but there's like multi-modal forms of publications that I've done amongst all of them. Has this been in relation to research that you've conducted? Yes, it has. Has it been in relation to fields uh, including child abuse pediatrics? Yes. 
Let's talk a little bit uh, about the uh, substance of child abuse uh, pediatrics. Does it include an evaluation of things like child morbidity? Yes, so the term morbidity means what is making children sick. And so one of the things that leads to morbidity or illness in children is um, abuse or neglect. And that can lead to long-term negative health out outcomes related to like adverse childhood experiences, child abuse and neglect being one of those. So understanding what the outcomes of any particular disease process is, is important. Does it include things like evaluation of epidemiology, prevalence rates, things like that? Absolutely. And when I'm using the term uh, epidemiology, what does that term mean within the context of child abuse pediatrics? So epidemiology means what is causing this particular problem or disease process. Uh, and with reference to the, the fact that you're here testifying in a courtroom uh, here today, this is the first time you've ever uh, testified in a courtroom before? It is not, no. Uh, in other proceedings, have you been qualified as an expert? I have, yes. Approximately how many times and in what courts? 113 times previously I've been qualified. I've been qualified in civil court, so um, civil court being family court largely, so that involves like child protective services a lot of the times. I have also been qualified in criminal courts um, and in federal court proceedings. Uh, has it been in fields related to general pediatrics and child abuse pediatrics? Yes, in both. Uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, your work in this particular case, um, what uh, brought you to this case? Did you actually treat the child as the subject of this proceeding? I did not, no. Uh, what, if anything, did you do in your evaluation of this case? So I was asked by an attorney to evaluate the case and to look at the medical information to help them understand the medical information and whether um, the information that was provided to me would be indicative of abuse or neglect in this case. Uh, with reference to the work that, that you were performing on this case, uh, was this a attorney from the government uh, that, that was asking you to perform this work? It was, yes. Uh, have you only testified in the capacity of a government attorney asking you to uh, review evidence? No, I have not. Uh, what other parties uh, have you been asked to provide your, your expertise in? So I've been asked um, to provide opinions to um, the defense as well as the prosecution. Um, the plaintiff or the respondent, depending on the type of court that you're in. And I've also done expert um, reviews of cases for both types of attorneys, so defense attorneys as well as prosecuting attorneys. Your Honor, at this time the, the state moves uh, that uh, Dr. Nino uh, be qualified as an expert in child abuse pediatrics and general pediatrics, and that she be able to testify as such. No objection. All right, uh, Dr. Dinao is recognized as an expert in the field of general pediatrics, child abuse pediatrics, and she may give an opinion in the third. Now, Doctor, uh, may I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that there were some materials that you reviewed. What was the general nature of the materials that you reviewed with reference to this case? So the general nature of the uh, materials that I reviewed were, was all of the medical information involved in this case. So that would be information from the hospitals that had contact with this child, as well as information from emergency medical services that transported this child from one place to another. And just to make sure that we're speaking with reference to uh, the same subject, uh, because I take it you have evaluated more than one child in your career, would that be fair to say? Yes, I have. Uh, could you provide a ballpark figure for the members of the jury as to how many children you treated uh, and were diagnosed through the course of your career? I have evaluated thousands of children. Um, we review, on average, 2,000 cases at my current location. Every single case is peer reviewed, so that means I take part in the evaluation process for all of those children. And I've been practicing for 11 years, so that will give you an idea of how many cases I've evaluated. It's quite numerous. And so to make sure that we're talking about the, the child of this proceeding, did you review records related to a baby doe born on January 7th, 2022? I did, yes. 
Uh, what data did you end up reviewing uh, informing any of your opinions in this case? So I reviewed a police report um, regarding the nature of the first contact with this infant, as well as um, emergency medical services records that transported the child from the location he was found to the hospital in Hobbs. I reviewed the hospital in Hobbs medical records and the records of the transport by emergency medical services from the hospital in Hobbs to the hospital in Lubbock and subsequently the medical records from the Lubbock hospital. Now let's talk about Baby Doe as Baby Doe is admitted in the Hobbs Medical Center. Uh, are we talking about a baby that was the epitome of good health at that point in time? No, we are not. Uh, what issues were you able to identify as an expert in this field uh, that baby, uh, uh, baby Doe was experiencing at that point in time? So the initial complaint or concern at the time of this child's presentation to emergency medical services was unresponsiveness, meaning this baby was not normally awake and alert. Hypothermia was also a significant issue, meaning this child's body temperature was well below a normal body temperature. Um, subsequently, um, with regard to being um, admitted into medical care, other issues became apparent through evaluation of laboratory studies, and that would be anemia most specifically, so that's a low red blood cell count, and acute kidney injury being another one of those areas of concern. And as you were reviewing the medical documentation of what Baby Doe was going through at the time of her entry, uh, what, was the, what was the trajectory of this baby uh, prior to treatment? Well, if the child wasn't found and subsequently intervention happening, inevitably this child would have died. And you use the term, inevitably the child would have died. Isn't there a, a little small fraction of a chance that the, the child could have survived? No. Why not? We're talking about a newborn infant who was left in the elements without a means to get food, shelter, warmth, all of those things that are necessities for life. The significance of the hypothermia alone would have resulted in this child's demise, if not changed. Um, beyond the hypothermia, this is also a child who had active bleeding from their umbilical cord. So um, losing blood like that leads to an inability of your body to carry oxygen appropriately to your organs, which would eventually result in organ failure. Additionally, um, when you're not feeding an infant um, or providing them with any sort of nutrition, it leads to alterations in things like electrolytes, and glucose levels, and subsequently would lead to things like cardiac arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, um, dehydration, and all of those things can also lead to death. So let's consider uh, each of these conditions that you've identified, Doctor, starting first with hypothermia. Uh, why, if at all, is hypothermia so deadly to the human body? Hypothermia, um, as it enters more severe stages, basically causes your body to stop functioning. Severe hypothermia is defined as a core temperature less than 82 degrees Fahrenheit. At the time that this baby's temperature could be recorded, it was 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is considered severe hypothermia. That temperature was taken subsequent to active rewarming. So at the time that he was found, it was probably more severe. When you have severe hypothermia, your body systems start shutting down. One is your mentation, meaning you can't wake up and you can't think. Another issue is your respiratory system. So you'll start having respiratory depression, meaning you're not breathing effectively, and eventually what we call apnea, which is periods where you stop breathing, and then respiratory arrest. 
and then your circulatory system also starts to shut down. So your heart rate will go down, which we call bradycardia, your blood pressure will go down, and your blood volume decreases. So what happens is your blood vessels dilate and become leaky, so blood products leak out of your blood vessels. You also have what's called cold diuresis, which means that because of the cold, you're losing fluid actively. So you're sweating, you're also um, losing um, through urination, so you're actively releasing liquid, which is kind of like a domino. Once one of those things start, all of the dominoes start to fall over. So you have a loss of blood volume, which then reduces your ability for your blood to circulate, which reduces your ability to get oxygen, and that will also lead to cardiac arrest and subsequent death. Uh, you've mentioned several concepts that were included within the hypothermia uh, the umbrella of that diagnosis. I heard bradycardia, uh, and I also heard about the, um, the heart rate uh, issue uh, as well as a result of hypothermia. Uh, did you see evidence of uh, either of those two specific subcategories that were a result of the hypothermia? So bradycardia is a heart rate issue. So it means your heart isn't going as fast as it should. So your body has a um, typical heart rate that it has to maintain in order to get blood to all of your body parts. And bradycardia limits your ability to do that. So a low heart rate is bradycardia. This child at the time of presentation had a heart rate of 75. Objection, where we approach your heart? their heart rate to be 120 to 160 beats per minute. When the heart rate gets sufficiently slow, so that's when it reaches 60 beats per minute, we will start chest compressions. So this child's heart rate was about half of what we would expect, but not quite at the level where we would provide chest compressions. And then for the uh, final or, or excuse me, second to last group of injuries that, that you specifically identified and before we proceed to uh, discussion regarding causes. Uh, you mentioned also uh, an acute kidney uh, injury as well that this child was experiencing. Uh, why is that a potential risk for a, a newborn baby? So acute kidney injury means that this child's kidneys were um, not able to function properly. And we measure that by a value called creatinine. So this child had elevated creatinine, which shows that the kidneys were injured. This child's kidneys could be injured in a couple of different ways. 
One is this child's profound anemia can lead to kidney injury because there's just not enough blood volume to support body processes. There was also a concern regarding potential dehydration based upon the lack of um, fluids this child had, which can also lead to kidney injury. The blood volume issue that we have because of the anemia and because of um, the vasodilation that happens in hypothermia would also lead to kidney problems. And then for the uh, final injury that you mentioned in your testimony, you mentioned an uh, issue with an umbilical cord. Uh, what was the issue as you observed it? So this child's umbilical cord was not clamped at the time of delivery. So your umbilical cord is what maintains your blood circulation when you're in utero. So the placenta, which is attached to mom's uterus inside the body, delivers blood to the baby through a single vessel, and then that brings oxygenated blood to the baby's body. It takes away deoxygenated blood from the baby's body through two arteries that go back to the placenta where it gets rid of waste and it reoxygenates the blood and sends it back to the baby. When the umbilical cord is cut, all of those vessels are open, which means that blood can leave the baby's body through those vessels, which is likely what caused this child's profound anemia. That also leaves an open access for bacteria and other insults to get into the baby's body because it's a direct access to the blood system. When you get infections into the blood system, that's termed sepsis in medicine and can lead to overwhelming systemic infection, which can also lead to ultimate demise if not treated. In the course of your review for this case and your evaluation of the observed hypothermia, bradycardia, uh, anemia, the acute kidney injury that you've referenced, uh, and the umbilical cord, uh, were you able to determine whether those were the consequences of a natural birth or of something else? I cannot determine whether this was a natural birth versus a cesarean section, for example. Um, however, hypothermia and anemia are not known consequences of a typical birth. Hypothermia especially is not a consequence of birth. Babies are maintained at normal body temperature inside mom's body, so they will come out at the temperature mom's body was at. So profound hypothermia is absolutely not a result of birth. There are reasons during the birth process that anemia could happen. The biggest issue being um, placental abruption, which means the placenta detaches from the uterus, and so then there's bleeding from the back of the placenta, so the blood that's going from the baby to the placenta isn't recirculating, but is bleeding out. So that could lead to anemia. Um, I cannot say how much of this child's anemia is related to the unclamped umbilical cord versus that and another sort of bleeding process at the time of birth. And as you've offered your opinions and comparing and contrasting uh, an ordinary natural birth versus uh, uh, something else, uh, are your opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, they are. Uh, and what does that mean to you as you offer your opinion to the members of the jury? That means based upon all of the information, the medical information provided, as well as my knowledge and experience of pediatrics and newborns specifically, with reasonable certainty. So um, I have created a differential diagnosis and I can say at the end of that, this is what most likely caused this child's finding. And when we're talking about what uh, caused this child's finding, uh, uh, does this appear to be a natural or a inflicted uh, sort of situation? Uh, definitely an inflicted situation, especially with regard to um, the hypothermia and the kidney injury, and at least partially the anemia. Uh, Your Honor, just one moment to confer with counsel. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, 
the state passes the witness. Okay, is the jury doing okay? Yes, Your Honor. Right? Okay, cross exam. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. So, you're a pediatrician. I am, yes. And you treat children from the ages of zero to 18. In general, yes. In general. And the exception will be children or other individuals up to the age of 24. About to the age of 24, sometimes I treat de um, de developmentally delayed adults as well. Okay, so so above the age of 24, some developmentally delayed adults. Yes, but a regular child, you would treat possibly up to the age of 24. That's correct. Okay. And so if a person turned 18, and they had to see you two weeks after that, you wouldn't turn them away because they were now grown. That's correct. Okay. So, you mentioned this before, but just to be very clear, you did not see the baby in question in this case. I did not know. You did not see the baby when, it, when the incident initially occurred? That's, I never saw the baby. That's correct. So up to today, you still haven't seen the baby? I have not done. Okay. So we'll go over a little bit of your testimony here today. Did you happen to, you said you reviewed the medical records from the baby, the baby's treatment? That's correct. And that will be starting from the moment the baby was taken by the ambulance to the hospital? That's correct. I also reviewed the um, police information, so the first responders before the child was transported to the hospital. Okay, so the police report from the initial response to the call. That's correct. And then the EMS transport report. Did you review that as well? That's correct. And then the uh, initial reports from the Hobbs emergency room. Yes. And all the way to the baby going to Covenant in Lubbock. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then up to the baby's discharge information from Covenant in Lubbock. I believe I have all of the records. That's correct. Um, what about any further pediatric um, out of the records from this baby. I didn't review any additional records for this baby. And you did not prepare a report about this opinion you're giving in court today, did you? I did not, though. No. Okay. So your opinion is ongoing as you think about the case, or how, how does that work? So it's based upon all of the information that I reviewed, and the opinion was generated after completion of review of those records. Okay, but it is undocumented. I did not write a written report. That is correct. Okay. Now, at the point when this baby was discharged from the hospital, how was the baby's health at the time? If it is determined that a child is medically stable, they will be discharged from the hospital. So he was determined to be medically stable at the point of discharge. Um, you did review the report from that discharge from the hospital? I don't remember specifically if I have the discharge summary, but I reviewed all of the neonatal intensive care records provided to me at the Lubbock facility. Okay, and so your conclusion is the baby must have been going fine is why he got discharged? Yes, we do not discharge children from the hospital if they're not well enough to be discharged. And. Um, We've heard testimony earlier that if the baby had any further complications, they would have been referred to a specialist. Do you know if this baby was referred? In regard to what, I'm sorry? Any baby specialist where a baby may have continuing health conditions discharged from the queue. I don't know if there were referrals to specialists to be followed up with. My guess is yes, that he was referred to ongoing medical care. We do that in pediatrics. Children should be followed by their pediatrician. 
So I'm going medical care with a pediatrician. That's correct. Okay. So, um, and you say children in general. Is that regardless of their health condition? That's correct. So every child should have a pediatrician effectively, right? Yes, that's correct. Regardless of the condition surrounding their birth? That's correct. Now, you talked a little bit about the condition of this baby when he was first found. And you testified about the umbilical cord. Yes, ma'am. Um, you reviewed photos of this baby? I did review photos, yes. Okay. And um, you did see some things on the baby's body, correct? I did see the baby, yes. Okay. Um, and we did have a pre-trial interview prior to today, isn't that right? That's correct. So you and I have conversed about this quite a bit in the past. We have, yes. Okay. So when you observed the baby, what was on the baby's body? In the photographs, the baby was covered in dried blood. Okay. And did you have any information as to the source of this dried blood? I did not. I presume it's the birth process, which is quite messy. Okay, so a baby who's born under just about any condition will be messy, maybe? Yes. Some blood on the baby? Blood. Sometimes the amniotic sac is on the baby's skin. They're just kind of yucky. So there's nothing on this baby's body from when you saw this photo that indicated that he had been bleeding at the time. I cannot say specifically where the blood came from that was on the child's body. Okay, and let's talk about the umbilical cord. You told us about the arteries that take the deoxygenated blood out of the baby through the umbilical cord, is that correct? That's correct, that's the fetal circulation. And that is fetal, which means while the baby is in the womb is when that occurs, right? That's correct. And so when the baby is birthed and out of the womb, that fetal circulation, your testimony is that that continues on? Until the umbilical cord clots or is clamped, then it's an open um, circulatory system, it's kind of like if you cut your arm and your blood vessels are open, it will continue to bleed because of the blood pressure inside your vessels until it either clots or is fixed. And so if this baby continuously bled through this umbilical cord, there will be more blood on the baby than just from the birth, right? Not necessarily. The cord is attached to the umbilicus, which is your belly button, and depending on how long the cord is, the blood that's from the cord, if it's not on top of the baby, could have bled into some other location. I cannot say specifically where the blood that was visualized on the baby came from. Did you see how long the cord was on this baby? Um, I don't recall specifically, but the cord was also um, clamped by EMS, and so it had been altered by the time that I had seen photographs. So you don't know how long the cord was before the baby's cord was clamped, correct? I don't know how long it was or if they cut the cord after they clamped it, that's correct. Okay, based on all the reports that you gathered, all the information that you read about the uh, this case, um, is there anything that indicated to you that the, the umbilical cord was just so far away from the baby that there was blood still in some place else? I cannot say with any degree of certainty where the blood on the baby was from. So from everything you saw and reviewed, there's nothing that indicates that this baby was actively bleeding when he was found. He was not actively bleeding at the time that he was found. He was noted to have wet blood on his body. There is absolutely evidence that there was active bleeding at some point, which led to anemia. Now, 
you continue to review the report and you talked about the possibility of sepsis, correct? That's correct. And um, sepsis, you indicate, or um, let me just ask, that is something that could occur in a baby born in non-ideal conditions? Potentially, yes. Uh, conditions that were, in, the, in your words, not normal. You can also get sepsis if you're born in normal conditions, quote unquote normal conditions. So if a child is born in the hospital, they could also potentially get sepsis. Um, there are multiple reasons a child could get sepsis. So the suspicion of sepsis in this matter has nothing to do, well, does not necessarily have to do solely with the child in the place that the child was found. It's a large factor in the risk of potential infection in this case. However, that could have happened with any other birth is what you're testifying to, correct? Depending on the circumstances of the birth, that's correct. Okay. Um, however, in this case, with this particular child, sepsis was not an issue. He was um, prophylactically treated for the significant risk of sepsis, which is medical standard of care. So if there's a concern for the potential that sepsis could happen, we automatically give antibiotics to the baby to prevent that from happening. And it ended up that he did not acquire sepsis, which means that worked. Okay. Um, okay. So you also indicate, speaking of the anemic condition of this baby, that it could have been from placenta bleeding, something to that effect? It is possible to have um, blood loss at the time of birth, not only through an unclamped <coughs> cord, but the placenta that detaches from the uterus. That is correct. And in this case, you do not know whether or not there was a placenta detachment from the uterus. I don't know if there was an abnormal detachment. Clearly, there at the end of birth, once the baby is out, there is a routine detachment of the placenta from the uterus. I don't know if there was a detachment at the time that circulation with the baby was still happening, which is called um, the placental abruption. So if there was a placenta abruption, that could be the cause of the anemia as opposed to, in this case, the location the baby was found. It wouldn't be the location that the baby was found that would have caused the anemia. It would be the bleeding from the unclamped umbilical cord that would cause the anemia. But it is also possible that there was a placental issue. I cannot say with certainty. Okay, so we don't know either or in this case, correct? I do know for certain that there was an unclamped umbilical cord and there is active bleeding from unclamped cords, which is why we clamped them. Right, but in this case, you also did not see active bleeding at all in any of the reports that you reviewed. Is that not correct? Not at the time that the baby was found. That is correct. Okay. Now, we've had some discussion earlier about temperature as well. That's correct. So if a baby were born and left to their own devices in any condition, would temperature possibly also be an issue? that depends on the type of environment that you're talking about and how long you're leaving the baby to their own devices. They don't have very many devices. Right. So a newborn baby doesn't even, is not capable of regulating their own temperature. Is that not correct? Not to the same degree that an adult can. Um, but if a child is maintained at ambient temp temperature, meaning in normal room temperature, they will not lose um, body temperature through um, conduction and convection in the same way as if they're left in a cold environment. Okay, so so a baby left alone with no clothing in any ambient temperature. What do you mean by ambient? First of all. So, like in a temperature controlled environment, like inside a home, inside a hospital, inside any sort of building where the temperature is controlled, that would not result in profound hypothermia. Okay. 
However, the baby's temperature might still fluctuate. I wouldn't expect a great deal of fluctuation. It could be slightly lower than we would like, depending on the circumstances, but it would not lead to profound hypothermia. What about dehydration? Could that occur if a baby was just left alone to the very minimal devices they had? If you didn't feed a baby for hours upon hours, then yes, they could get dehydration. So a baby who was abandoned could have exactly the same symptoms or similar as the baby in this case? Well, the baby in this case was abandoned, so yes. Okay. Um, Doctor, you were asked some questions on cross with regards to your review of uh, the continuing medical treatment of baby uh, Doe in this case. Uh, do you remember your, your answers to those questions? I believe so, yes. Uh, my question for you is, uh, uh, would it be fair to say that there is a degree of recovery that baby Doe experienced through the course of the medical treatment that he received? Yes, there was. Uh, does the fact that with medical intervention, the patient gets better make the original injury any less life-threatening? No, it does not. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Any follow-up? No, Your Honor. Any questions from the jury? Any objection to excusing uh, the doctor? No, not from the state, Your Honor. Not from the state. Here, excuse me. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, is the jury doing okay? Anybody need a break? Okay, let's take a break at this time. During the break, don't discuss the case. Don't allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. Don't do any research on the case. Don't form any fixed opinions until the case is finally submitted to you. Please stand for the jury. Okay. Uh, you're, you 
your uh, general intent instruction, uh, you've got it covering both, and I don't believe it should. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, then. Um, we'll take a break. We'll see you all uh, when the jury's ready to go. Usually it takes about 15 minutes. Let's say, let's be back at 20 till 4. 24, sorry.
what records? Uh, patient medical records. Okay. And is it specifically for a certain facility? Yes, ma'am. It's all of the hospital district, so that includes um, ER, OR, med surge, and then we serve a large clinic basis. That will include all of the specialty clinics on campus, as well as school base, um, FHC, HMC, and Tatum Clinic. And does anyone generally have access to these records? All of the frontline staff would have access to the records only on a need-to-know basis. And then my staff would touch only their appropriate areas, and my release of information are the only staff members that release the records. Okay. Um, so does that have to go through you to have a release of records? Through my department, yes. Your department. Okay. Um, and how long have you been in this uh, job function? I've been in my role for about two years. Is Norley Hospital one of the hospitals in the district you just testified to? Yes. Um, did Norley Hospital have records for a patient by the name of Alexis Avila? Yes, ma'am. Um, were you asked to access those records? Yes, ma'am. And were you able to do so successfully? Yes, ma'am. And um, by asking them, did you uh, pull a copy of them? I guess I should clarify. Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, do you know what those records are dated? Yes, ma'am. They are January 6, 2022. Right. Ma'am, a moment. Um, You're right. the witness for purposes of laying foundation for an exhibit. You may. Thank you. Ms. Marinovich, I handed you what's now been marked as State's Exhibit 32. Uh, have you had an opportunity to uh, preview State's Exhibit 32? Yes, ma'am. And um, uh, do, they, do these records appear to be in the same or accurate condition of the records that you pulled in this case? Yes, ma'am, aside from several areas being whited out, but it is the same record. Okay, so um, you're aware that some redactions have occurred in these medical records, but apart from those redactions, the content appears to be a fair and accurate depiction of the records? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and um, it doesn't appear to be altered by anyone else at any point? No, ma'am. Okay, and at this time, State would offer Exhibit 32 at two evidence. No, ma'am. All right, Exhibit 32 is admitted without objection and may be published to the jury. Thank you. I'm going to treat this. Exhibit 32 is I'm showing you um, the first page of uh, State's Exhibit 32. Um, there appears to be some white spots. Is that what you were referring to as the redacted portion? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and in your job function and as a nurse, are you uh, familiar with the components that make up a medical record? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And are some of these components, for example, medication we see? Yes, ma'am. Um, additional patient information, for example, the admission information. Yes, ma'am. And clinical notes, progress notes. Yes, ma'am. And um, would a record contain any information regarding discharge? Yes, every record should. Okay. And um, based on your review of this record, was the discharge information included? Yes, ma'am. It's not noted on this page that's listed here, but on the following page, I believe that it's listed on page 9. So I believe the next page is page 8, and I'm referring you to now what I believe to be page 9 on the bottom. It says 
was there. Yes. Do you see it included in the record on this page? Yes, ma'am. Where specifically? Um, the section abo above results and follow up. So right here, yes, ma'am. Where it says patient sent to the ER for further evaluation due to suspected Braxton Hicks versus labor contractions. Yes, ma'am. Right. May I have a moment, Your Honor? We'll pass the witness. Just a moment, Your Honor. Sure. by one of the hospitals that you, facilities, I'm sorry, that you work with. 
Potentially, yes. Okay. And this document indicates that Alexis Avila was seen on January 6th of 2022? Yes, ma'am. It also says that she may return to school on January 7th of 2022. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Any redirect? If I may just have a moment. No reader has your honor. I'm in the state that's not reserving the service. All right. Any questions from the jury of Ms. Marinovich? Any objection to excusing Ms. Marinovich? Not from the defense. You're excused. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been advised that the witnesses uh, that are available to testify will be available in the morning. So we're going to recess early again tonight. Once again, uh, don't discuss the case. Don't get on the internet. Don't read the newspaper articles. Uh, don't uh, do any independent research. Don't form any fixed opinions about the case until the case has finally been submitted to you. We'll start again uh, like we did this morning. Uh, if you can get here at 8.15, and then when you're all in the jury uh, room, and I'm told to start about at 8.30. Please stand for the jury. Okay, in terms of uh, tomorrow morning, uh, who do you plan on starting with? Uh, Your Honor, uh, we have been able to confirm with Dr. Bowman that he will arrive around 8 a.m. So we can have him in the morning, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Drennan. Uh, and so uh, it will be one of them. Uh, I will just confer with them, with the doctor. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to both just sitting at 8 o'clock, right? Uh, so we'll have them with their both being in the morning, uh, and then we'll proceed with uh, Detective Perez. Okay. And it sounds like uh, we'll likely get the state's part of the case in, so depending on uh, who you want to call, you need to be ready to, and there'll be motions, and we'll, go, and we'll see where that takes us, but we'll, uh, you need to be prepared to call witnesses tomorrow afternoon, it sounds like. We will be. And uh, once again, Ms. Avila, let me advise you that whether you testify or not is your personal decision. You have competent counsel to discuss that matter with. Once again, I urge you to talk with your lawyers and listen to them, but in the end, you make that decision. Okay, anything we need to talk about? I, I need those jury instructions on my bench in the morning from the defense. State, clean up your jury instructions. I've, I've done that, Your Honor. They've done okay. it and printed, and I will put them back together and share them with uh, okay. defense. Do you want me to email to your TCAA the state's uh, correct? Yeah, we, can, we can run them off then. Okay, right, or I can send them to the, the clerk's well, office, whatever. I'm almost done. I'll just when I get to the hotel, I'll email them to y'all. That would be good. That way we can uh, get working on them and the jury won't have to be sitting around while we yes. uh, work on them. Of course, we'll, we'll talk about them and the ones that are in dispute and so forth. We'll allow a record on the ones that are denied or if they're given or not. Okay, anything else we need to talk about from the state? From the defendant? Nothing from the defendant. All right, y'all have a good evening. Uh, let's be here again tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, <Surprise. laughs>